So thank you all for being here. Can uh, can you hear me okay, especially if you're in the back? Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Welcome all for being here. Um, I will call our special meeting to order and I will uh, go over a few uh, meeting logistics. Um, anyone who's participating remotely, I would ask you to change your uh, name display so that it shows your first and last name so we know who we're talking to and who's talking to us. Anyone who uh, wishes to speak must be recognized by the mayor. We'd ask you to start out by uh, stating your name and where you live. I'd ask you to keep your- Can you speak up, please? Uh, the hearing, the refrigeration makes this down if possible to hear. What? Uh, you can sit closer too. Yeah, I, I'll. I think everyone needs to uh, try to speak as loud as possible, um, and I will continue to do that. I recognize we've got some interference. Um, anyone who wishes to speak, we'd ask you to uh, keep your comments to three minutes. Although, since it is uh, a workshop format, I'll try to uh, maintain some flexibility. On the on the timing, and uh, that is about it. Anyone who speaks out of term goes term goes on too long or veers away from the topic at hand. We will ask you to redirect your comments to what we're here to talk about. Um, I'll start out. We have we have some council members who are here uh, participating remotely. I would ask uh, ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, this is Carrie Brown, District Three. Helen Cole, District Two. Thank you, and uh, Councillor uh, Heaney will be here uh, a little later. Um, <clears throat> next item is to approve the agenda. I assume the members of the council. There's no changes proposed for the agenda. So we will consider the, the agenda approved. Next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And we will take comments from the from the room and also from um, from those participating remotely. And it looks like we have someone already. Zach, come on up. All right, um, Zach Hughes, uh, Montpelier, um, District 3. Um, and I wanna thank the council for its willingness to come over here tonight uh, so I could be here in person um, and thank the council general and the city staff for all the work we've done over the last five years on this topic we'll discuss. But I wanted to speak about another topic. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to say on two topics, I am gratified to hear that uh, the Senior Center ha will have a new director. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, and I also wish to thank the council for creating a youth uh, uh, committee. Uh, this has been a really important uh, thing for me when I was younger to have so when I was younger to have some sort of avenue. And I think it's really important for the youth to have that. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, Zach. Um, anybody else here in the room wishes to be uh, heard? Steve, come on up. I need to sit down. We have some interference here. Uh, I think that's a quote, a, a good quotable. Um, how did we get here? Would you start by? Oh, Steve yourself? Whitaker, Montpelier. And this portion of the agenda is for topics not yeah. on tonight's yeah. agenda. How did we get here? And it's a combination of complacency, uh, incompetence, uh, indifference, 
uh, and deny dignity both to ourselves and to each other. And so I'm going to read this quote. It's only a minute and a half. I've timed it. Kurt Vonnegut spoke at the 200th anniversary of the founder of the Unitarian Church on the question of human dignity. Doesn't God give dignity to everybody? No, not in my opinion. Giving dignity, the sort of dignity that's of some earthly use anyway, is something that only people do or fail to do. What happens if you credit a bum with human dignity, a drunken bum with his pants full of shit and snot dangling from his nose? At least you haven't made yourself poorer in a financial sense, and he can't take whatever it is you've given him and spend it on Thunderbird wine. There is this drawback, though. If you give to that sort of a stranger the uncritical respect that you give to friends and relatives, you will also want to understand and help him. There's no way to avoid this. Be warned, if you allow yourself to see dignity in someone, you've doomed yourself to wanting to understand and help whoever it is. If you see dignity in anything, in fact, it doesn't have to be human. You will still want to understand it and help it. Many people are now seeing dignity in the lower animals and the plant world and waterfalls and deserts, and even in the entire planet and its atmosphere. And now they are helpless not to want to understand and to help these things. Poor souls. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Is this on? Right. My name. But I'm not sure it's my. It's not amplifying within the room. I think so. You need to. Yeah, we, we can hear it. Oh. Okay. This. My name is Opeyemi Param. I am a resident of Montpelier, and I wanted to speak on the issue of where we are with the homeless crisis in a very practical way. Which was, I read the 14 pages that you all have put together, and I still see two things missing. One is when we're talking about trash and encampments and all the sanitation, I want it spelled out that we're going to provide sanitation through things like porta potties, because this is a cycle that gets people into trouble. Uh, there's no place for this. And then, then it's illegal. And next it's unsanitary. So I've seen that happen in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And I saw that happen in Brattleboro. Brattleboro had the sense to immediately when they had trouble with unhoused people, get some porta potties in public places downtown and various parts of town. Issue number two, very quickly, the people I do not see represented here as stakeholders remain people who have substance addi addiction problems and women particularly, but everyone experiencing domestic abuse, because those are the people that people don't want to take into their homes and are making it difficult uh, for everybody to get behind the fact that that's not representative of everybody. That is a subset of people who are unhoused right now, but they're not in the room uh, as a part of this conversation as I see it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Yes, Klein up. Hi, my name is Sarah Richards. I'm a resident of Montpelier, um, and I have a couple of questions, one of them being, what efforts were made to bring the homeless population here to this meeting tonight? And my other question is, why is this now an emergency when uh, we started discussing homelessness and the issue that it was gonna bring to us back in 2020 during the COVID crisis? I have a personal experience being homeless um, and I would just wanna find out more information about that those topics. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any response to that? Um, yeah, actually to both of your comments. Um, I think the goal of tonight's meeting, we've invited state officials here, uh, both our elected officials and the folks from DCF, and it was really to have a conversation about what the state was doing and what the city was doing. It was, I think it was more of a shorter term uh, issue like, the situation is exploding around the state. The hotels are closing, which I think is uh, a bit of the emergency. It wasn't, I don't think we're in a position tonight to take on a wider range conversation about all the root causes of homelessness. It's more people are being let out of, uh, out of hotels. 
cities and towns are having difficulty providing the types of services we talked about sanitation that was made and what is the state's plan? How can we work together to deal with that? So appreciate the questions. Um, certainly it has been a long conversation. We had a huge meeting this summer where we invited all of our service providers and folks to be there. We had a couple meetings in August where we had homeless folks present. Um, so it's an ongoing conversation. No one's gonna solve problems tonight. The goal really is, is to work with our state partners to figure out what, what we can put in place and what folks in the community are concerned about and want to see dealt with. So great questions. And I think that's at least my answer. I can't answer for this, the elected officials. But. Were the homeless invited? There's a question. I just, yeah, I believe I just answered that. No one specifically, the only people that were specifically invited, this was a, and who was that? I didn't hear who that was. Someone asked a question that didn't identify yeah, could, themselves. Could we hear? Good, good citizen. Yeah, could you say who's calling? Okay, well, uh, the answer is the only people that were specifically invited to this meeting were state officials, state elected officials, and interested groups uh, who had already issued statements. And I think then we have some service providers here who have chosen to come mm -hmm. and other interested individuals. This was really intended to be a workshop of city officials and state officials with other interested people <laughs> laying in. Um, so that's the answer. Yes, ma'am. No, excuse me. If you want to speak, I'm going to ask you to speak. Step up to the mic, please. I, um, yeah, I, just, I actually don't want to speak to the issue. I want to ask you about the process. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm Jeff Hoffman. I'm a resident of Montpelier member of the homelessness task and a member of the homelessness task force and um somebody just very wisely asked me who's here as a stakeholder asked me when is the appropriate time for them to speak um i don't know when is the appropriate time for them to speak so i tried to ask when is the appropriate time for them to speak we, we will have, thank you have time for everyone who wishes to be heard mm -hmm. to be heard great okay. thank you okay i'm not seeing other hands raised any other hands raised and so what i'm going to do is start in on our agenda. I uh, appreciate everyone's come here. Yes. I was invited. And I've invited a few homeless people. If, you're, if you'd like to speak again, please come to the microphone because that's the way that your voice can be carried out to the remote. Is it is on? Oh, okay. Um, so that means you still need to keep your voice up. Is okay. a seat right near there, Steve, if you can hear better, sitting right next to the speakers, instead of sitting when they're yelling at all? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was invited. I was invited by our representative, uh, Connor Casey. And hey, um, you say your name, please? my name is Mary Clark. I live at Five River Street. Uh, I'm a retired from the Montpelier Police Force. Uh, as a community service officer, that's what my title was. I wrote parking tickets and I went to the food shelves and I went to the soup kitchens and I went to the library and I went to all the places where people who were vulnerable and in need were. And when the chief hired me, he asked me, he said, you know, I need you to keep an eye out for more vulnerable people in our city. And I thought that was uh, nice. So I worked for him for 10 years, but I've been going to the soup kitchens for 20 years. And they were instituted by uh, Mont Montpelier had an interfaith council, 1980. They've been going on since 1980. And they provide a warm meal and um, <clears throat> smiles, you know, just nice company every day at a different church in Montpelier. They've been doing this for 45 years. Okay, so yesterday there's, there was a rumble at one. Things are getting out of control. And why all of a sudden now, you know, why is it all this homeless, uh, why? And <clears throat> Well, my thinking is, is that uh, it's just too tough to comply with the way the postmodern world is. I'm struggling and I'm, I'm a pretty smart, educated person. And I just think, wow, you know, people who ha haven't had the opportunities that I've had aren't gonna be able to do this. And, um, <clears throat> okay, so what's, what's different? Well, this year, since the flood, <laughs> um, the soup kitchen has been at the same place every day. And you wouldn't think at first glance that this is any big deal. But what it has done, it's caused a sort of creation of a group, of a club. We've gotten to know each other. 
you know, we're more than acquaintances a little bit. And this was in um, seven days last week. Uh, this guy 25 years ago prophesied that um, without clubs and groups, democracy was facing an end and the isolation would become overwhelming. And I, I just think, well, it took 25 years for anybody to listen to him. And there, here's the documentary, and I haven't seen it, but um, I've just witnessed, you know, the power of this at this daily meal that we have here every day in Montpelier, and and it's happening now. And so, all of a sudden, here's this group of people that are unhoused, and what has really emerged from them is that they are amazing at surviving in the wild, you know, out in the natural forces and everything. And we are not looking at this as a a potential uh, uh, asset, you know, that these people have to offer. And I think if we were to look at that and, and, and also that they have to have this kind of contact with the natural world and with the wild, at least for an interim. And so I've come up with a couple of ideas, little increments that um, I can see us maybe um, easing people out of tent living. Maybe some people want to stay in tent living. Maybe we should upgrade the tents and have yurts. My idea, my first idea is that we we have a um, variety show at Lost Nation Theater. And the people who are going to put on the show are the people who are in this group that I'm talking about, who frequent the soup kitchen and the pantry and the library, and who are getting to know each other, and many of whom are unhoused, not everybody, but a lot of people have talents. A lot of people want to show up. So I think it would be a fabulous time. And the proceeds of the show would go to buying the first yurt. We buy a yurt. Uh, Mary. Yes. You're at three minutes I now. Am, is that the max? Yes. Okay. So okay. We'll, um, we'll make sure to get, get you a chance again. You will? Yes. Okay. You know what? I have to go and pick up some homeless people who I agreed to give a ride. So I'm going to have to leave. So okay. how long again before would that be? I, I can't forget. Oh, not tonight, you mean? No, I, if you can come back, yeah, that'd be good. But I have to go pick up these kids. Okay. I promise I'd give them a ride. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, I'm going to move into our agenda. As people have already observed, we've been confronting the issue of homelessness for, uh, for years here in Montpelier. And... Uh, the city government and the taxpayers of Montpelier have uh, have done what's within the capacity of the city to do to provide services and to provide help for people, for our community members who are uh, living without housing. But it is also very clear that uh, the city of Montpelier, in a, within our own resources, does not have enough resources to uh, to meet the need. And uh, so city leaders in Montpelier and other cities across the state have come together to, uh, to ask state government to uh, step up to uh, expand the efforts that uh, they've been made and, and to address the crisis that uh, is facing not only Montpelier, but every city of any size uh, in the state. And so I appreciate the... Uh, state officials for coming here. And uh, I'd like to start by inviting uh, Chris and anyone else who's come with you to uh, give us an update on how things, how things are going and what the uh, state government is doing. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Winters. I'm the commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I come alone. I didn't, didn't bring any staff with me. So if no you do- No bodyguards, no <laughs> detail. <laughs> I saw the cars out in the parking lot. I was wondering <laughs> so many people were going to find it here. Okay. Um, so I, I may not have all the, the details and the specific answers, but I know the people who can get them for you, um, but happy to give you a, a general update. I think, you know, just as a, as a baseline, as, as most people in this room know, the appropriations bill passed this year changed the hotel motel program, what we call general assistance emergency housing. Uh, it changed eligibility. It changed the number of days available to folks and it put a cap on the number of hotel rooms that we can use. So the impacts of that have started to be felt um, starting September 15th. 
when the number of rooms we were available to use uh, was capped at 1,100 rooms. Um, and then on September 19th, that was the date from July 1st when the 80 day uh, maximum of uh, eligible days in the non-adverse weather months ran out. So we started to see households exhausting their 80 days starting September 19th. Um, some people came in later, some people went in and out, some people did uh, self-pay. So that exodus continues to, to trickle over the next couple of weeks. Um, and, that, and we know that between September 19th and October 14th, there were 85 households in, uh, in this district. Uh, we call it the, the Barry District. Um, which includes uh, Barry, Berlin, and Montpelier, where we do have uh, hotels participating in the program. So between September 19th and October 14th, 85 households exited. That's about um, 116 adults and 30 children included in that number. We will continue to see additional households exit, a much smaller number, but still significant for those families. 15 more households over the next two weeks uh, that includes two children. Um, and so we understand that has a tremendous impact on, on communities, that has a, a tremendous impact on service providers who are uh, dealing with much more than they've had to deal with before. Uh, and I do wanna take the opportunity to really thank our local providers. We have some very good ones here in central Vermont. Uh, who are doing some, some great work to help people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, I'll say that we do continue to run the hotel motel program for others who have come into it. Uh, there are still 93 rooms being used in the area. That's um, 90 different households. Again, similar numbers, 123 adults and 33 <coughs> children. Uh, and uh, we're also aware that uh, through some local generosity and some of those providers, some of those households remain housed, uh, even though their 80 days have expired. The program shifts again uh, back uh, to no room cap on December 1st. Uh, but of course, we have an immediate crisis in front of us uh, with the people who have exhausted their days, who are unsheltered, who right now don't qualify for general assistance emergency housing. Starting um, July 1st, when this bill was passed, uh, we had the, the, uh, an appropriation of $10 million to stand up additional emergency shelter across the state. I'll tell you that that's always challenging. You have to have a, a willing community and um, say we're very thankful that Montpelier is a willing community. We don't see that in every community. You need to have the buildings available and you need to have a provider to run the shelter, to run it safely, to run it responsibly, uh, to provide the services that the folks staying there need. Um, so with that $10 million, we received uh, quite a few applications, including from uh, Good Samaritan Haven. Um, and we have six projects that we're running right now uh, to stand up additional shelter capacity across the state uh, in St. Albans, in Burlington, in Rutland, in the Upper Valley, and um, here in Montpelier by expanding some additional beds at the Elks Club um, and improving the facilities. Um, in addition to that, you probably saw the news recently that the state is uh, moving to open three additional shelters uh, focused on families. We're providing the state properties for that. We've been you know, looking for quite a, quite a while at the different vacant state properties that we have that could potentially be used for shelter. Um, and we've identified the, uh, the former police barracks in Williston, uh, the Waterbury Armory, which we've been having conversations with the Waterbury community for quite some time about that. Um, and there are a couple of other properties here in Montpelier, uh, I think former state office buildings, residential like buildings uh, that we're taking a look at that. Um, and do we know what buildings those are yet? I, I don't think I can say today, um, <clears throat> uh, Councillor McCullough, um, but that's a lot of moving parts with that. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just about to say, we still don't have a provider, which is key. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so we have to have conversations about that and see what we can possibly do. Same goes for Waterbury, same goes for Williston. Um, I will say that in the past year, we have added approximately across the state 100 shelter beds. So I think part of the, the strategy is to increase shelter space as the GA program decreases. It's not been a one-to-one -one decrease to increase by any means. Um, but we do find that people are much more successful in a shelter situation when they're connected to services, when they're connected to a provider, um, when they get the things that they need to help move their lives forward to more permanent housing. We don't see that as much in the hotel motel space, although we've tried to do outreach into the hotel motels. It's not as easy or not as successful. Uh, so we have about a hundred, hundred bed increase this year. We expect about another hundred bed increase next year. Um, you know, just to speak to some of the other investments that the state makes through the housing opportunity program grants, it's about $27 million a year. Um, some 3 million of that or so uh, comes to those uh, organizations in central Vermont, like uh, Good Samaritan Haven, Elevate Youth, Circle, Capstone, uh, to help support services around, uh, around um, helping people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so all of these pieces are moving forward um, bit by bit. We often run into problems with uh, siting shelters. Uh, we either have zoning issues, we, ha we have uh, community opposition, uh, and in particular, it's very difficult to find the workforce and the providers to run those, those shelter operations. Um, so I can tell you that um, we, we are doing some things in central Vermont. We understand that there are a, a large number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness right now, and that's gonna continue to be a problem, uh, a significant problem until December 1st when those hotel rooms expand back out uh, to you know, some, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 uh, hotel rooms. So <clears throat> the cap now is, I think you said 1,000 or 1,100. 1,100. So it's going up. An additional 400 hotel rooms. An additional 400 hotel rooms. And I will say that we're right now statewide using about 800. Uh, so okay. people do not have the eligibility because they've used their 80 days. And that, and that even when the cap goes away on December 1st, the 80 day uh, limit stays in effect. Is that right? It does. Um, and I expect the legislature will take a look at that as soon as they're back in, in session. But I think a lot more people than folks anticipated stayed in from July 1st straight through to September 19th, used their 80 days up and are no longer eligible. That 80 days is a cap all the way through July 1st of next year. So the adverse weather program goes from December 1st to April 1st. Um, so that will end on April 1st and a number of the, pe the people who are who've already used their 80 days now will not have any more days to use as of April 1st in the spring. Okay, any other members of council have, have questions? So go ahead, Laura. I mean, I don't know how the process is gonna go tonight. Well, I mean, let's, we've got Chris here. Chris right is up now, here, so. yeah. yeah. I mean, are, are people thinking about like, this just seems so like fundamentally broken that we're putting people out. There's no plan, even the plan to bring on another hundred beds online. Like we know that we're creating mass unsheltering of people and we're, we're not offering adequate support and it just feels inhumane and wrong. And I'm not, I'm not hearing anything that's giving comfort. Like clearly people are working hard to try to like set up the shelters that you are and all of that. And just like, is there a rethinking like, or how can we get a different plan going to try to not persist with something that just feels like we're creating huge challenges that are gonna have ripple effects for generations? I'll, I'll say that we are, working within the budget and the program limitations that were handed to us. Um, it would take a, a different source of funding 
it would take a, a, a different approach than what was passed in the law this year to address what we're seeing right now beyond trying to stand up additional shelters with the funding that, that we've been given. Um, we are making as many efforts as we can to connect people to services, to connect them to providers, to try to help them make plans. Um, I think this was predictable, but a lot of people didn't anticipate the, ex the extent of it, of what it would look like at this time of year. I think uh, people thought pe that those in the hotel program might exit and come back in during the colder weather months. Um, that didn't happen for a lot of folks for understandable reasons, because who wants to be outside any time of year, uh, homeless? Um, so standing up shelters, in particular these three family shelters is one response, uh, but we understand that that certainly doesn't cover a lot of other people who are still without a place to stay. Yeah. And Lauren, try to keep your voice up. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand you have to, now you've got the laws that you have to follow that were enacted. Um, is there, you know, just knowing like your team, unlike our citizen legislature that doesn't have staff really, and that, you know, like your team is the one that I think has the expertise to be able to coming up with a better plan and like a more forward looking proactive vision. Um, you know, even the, you know, our wonderful providers, like there's so much just direct support. So being able to like lift your head up and come up with a statewide plan to address it. Like, I don't know what other entity. And so like, is there, is there planning and visioning that could be coming to the legislature with a different approach that's being led by your office? Is there some, do we need to, call on legislators to hire an independent consultant to come in and like re-envision this because you don't have that capacity. Like how do we not just keep doing this and be like, well, it's horrible, but this is what we're, the hand we're dealt. It's a really complicated question. It's um, one thing that we talked about a lot is um, that we need more affordable housing units. We have supports, we have subsidies, we have the services to move people into more permanent housing, but we don't have the units to do that. Um, so housing is obviously a big part of the discussion. And then the other approach has been to try to increase the number of traditional shelter beds as we decrease the hotel motel program. Um, and it was really, a, it was a budget discussion in the legislature to try to make the size of the program fit into a into a certain budget number, and I guess um, those decisions didn't take into account what was going to be happening right now. Carrie, thank you um, so much, Chris. Um, I really want to follow up on what you and Lauren were just talking about. And so just first of all, I want to say I really appreciate your being here tonight. And I, I completely appreciate that you are working within the limitations of the legislature. And, and I, I know what that's like. Um, so I have two questions. I'm wondering if what you just said about um, the the way people used the way people came in and out of shelters was not what we expected and the number of of beds that are required are you able to do you think it's possible that you could do a needs analysis uh to be able to say this is what the actual need is and not for housing because yes that's a long-term issue of having housing to move people into and it's great that we have the capacity to help people move into housing but if we don't have the housing then what we need are shelter beds and we need emergency housing and so is there a way that you could do you could provide to the legislature the actual need and let them know this is what's going to be happening and then my second part of my question is um is there something that municipalities can do? Is there something that we can do to help support that effort so that you can get the funding that will actually meet the need instead of taking the funding and trying to sort of squish the need into the funding available? Thanks, Carrie. And I should just note that I'm seeing uh, a, 
the message that your bandwidth is low, so and you're kind of breaking up, so you might want to turn your video off the next time you're talking. <clears throat> Not that we don't want to see you. Carrie, thanks for the question. Um, the DCF program is in, you know, was designed originally as a safety net, as a fallback, as a last resort. Um, the housing questions are much bigger than, than DCF and they're complicated. The substance use questions, the mental health questions, the uh, folks with disabilities, the health issues that people are facing. Um, so housing has been part of the conversation. There are people a lot more well-versed in it than I that made a lot of proposals to the legislature last year about the number of units needed and how that correlates to um, the numbers of homelessness, the, the amounts of homelessness that we see in the state of Vermont. Uh, the local providers on the ground, I mean, we do have, it's a difficult population to count. Um, I think because we have done such a, a good job in the past of housing people who are experiencing homelessness, our counts are probably more accurate than in, in many states. Uh, there's a point in time count that happens once a year. We're currently working with local communities and providers to try to get an, an assessment of what the need is now. Um, in some ways, it was really difficult to predict how many people would have an alternative. Um, some people have been in the hotel motel program for years. Uh, some people have recently come in and gone back out again. Um, so I think we, you know, again, hard to know how many people would have an option when their 80 days ran out. And they don't tend to like contact us and tell us, yep, all good. I found, you know, I found a place here, found a place there. Maybe they went to live with a relative. Maybe they went out of state. Maybe they're camping. Maybe they're living in a car. Um, so we are trying to get a real assessment of what the need is right now. Some of our, our community partners are a part of that. Um, and that was some of the um, approach was to say, how many additional shelters do we need? Where do we need them? Uh, I think going into next year, we really do have to have a serious conversation about the GA program, what it's intended for, who it's designed to serve, um, and that comes at a cost. And you know, the, the we've spent about fifty million dollars on hotels this year. It's it's been about that for the last five years. Um, and the, you know, the question that often comes in front of the legislature is, you know, could that money have been spent better somewhere else? Do we need to spend it both uh, in the hotel program temporarily and also on building up affordable housing and shelters at the same time? Um, and that's a really tough fiscal decision that, you know, the legislature kind of came to grips with having to reduce the size and the eligibility of the hotel motel program and protect uh, some of the more vulnerable categories of folks within it, um, and also to maintain the adverse weather as you know a life-saving measure when it does get it is getting cold outside already. Um, so I you know those are some of the the conversations that were had. There have been multiple plans put forward. There have been multiple advocates um, and housing advocates and homelessness advocates. Um, arguing for different versions of the program. And I expect that conversation is going to happen yet again this year. So Chris, if I could follow up on that, certainly I, I, I get that you uh, back in uh, March and April when the legislature was, uh, was considering this, you didn't know how many people were going to be leaving the motel program, but but throughout the summer, through July, August, September, you certainly were in touch with everybody who was in the motel program. And so you knew how many people were still in that program during that time, right? Yes. Yeah, we started our communication immediately as soon as we had kind of our, our marching orders there from the legislature and what it would look like. So we started outreach right away <laughs> to those in the program, uh, to providers. Uh, to the hotel owners and operators, um, and to the towns most most impacted, having conversations about that $10 million and what could we do with that $10 million? Can you bring us a, a property? Can you bring us a provider? Um, what could be possible in, in your city or in your town? Um, and that resulted in, in some additional shelter, but um, 
probably not what the legislature thought it would get for $10 million. And speaking just for myself, but probably other people have a similar concept, $50 million, million a year to put people up in motels, but we can't, we can't do either one. We can't say, well, okay, all we're gonna do is spend this $50 million on motels and not put money into, uh, into creating shelters, even though that means bigger outlay overall. Similarly, we can't tell people, well, okay, well this year we're not gonna put any money into shelters because we're gonna put it all into uh, shelters and, uh, and permanent housing because again, that's putting people outside and everybody, I know there are these distinctions about who's vulnerable and who's not, but when it, it's probably gonna be in the 30s tonight and colder over time, it, under those circumstances, everybody's vulnerable. So, so what do we do? Um, Jack? Yes. Um, Chris, I'm just, I'm curious about a couple and, and of things. Try to make sure you keep your voice. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, I mean, even one of the things you mentioned is having trouble finding service providers. So I'm curious what we're doing, because if, even if we had housing tomorrow, we probably wouldn't have enough providers to manage the facilities that we need. So that that's part one. And, the second question is, um, is there, what sort of emergency powers does the state have? I mean, we just had, I mean, not to oversimplify it, but we just had a couple of floods. So we knew it was going to rain. We didn't know how much it was going to rain. And once we found out that it was lots of rain, we declared an emergency. So we knew people were, were, were going to be exiting. We didn't know how many. Now we do. Why isn't it an emergency? That's a good question. Many people have asked, can we declare a state of emergency? I think the governor does have the power to do that. What would um, that what would that accomplish? I mean, if if he if he did declare it an emergency, what does that open up uh, in this case? Because yeah, it's not just, a earthquake, it's not a flood. It's yeah. um I'm not exactly sure. I'm not the the yeah. scholar on uh, the governor's emergency powers, but I think shelters could be just, you know, placed in communities over there, you know, whether they wanted them or not. Um, you could utilize the National Guard, you could, um, you know, tap some other funding sources uh, if a state of emergency were declared. Uh, but I think there's there's folks who don't think this is, we're at a point of a state of emergency. Other state funding sources or federal? Um, state, I don't think we state. Would. I mean, I guess we could ask for funding, but I'm not sure. sure. Yeah. Something um, like that for a situation like this, not, not flooding. Yeah. Um, hi, Chris. Um, my name's Adrian, and thank you for being here tonight. My background's in public health. I work in public health. Homelessness has been declared a, a national emergency. I work with CDC every day, um, and there's been federal funds that have been set aside to focus on this issue. It is extremely complex, as you have stated. And homelessness impacts every part of our government. Um, it knows no boundaries. And so from a government perspective, thinking at a systems level, how is the state of Vermont working across all of our government agencies to coordinate, to talk, to share funding? It's not just coming from your department. Um, there should be money coming from the Department of Public Health. There absolutely should be federal funds coming into the state of Vermont to support housing, to support homelessness, to support shelters, to support food, to support, I mean, everything that is part of a human, we should be able to receive funding to support that. We should be able to be training people. There's the workforce issue. Um, it is a very holistic approach that we should be taking in Vermont. And I just don't see that happening. It's very frustrating. Um, and it really comes from the top down at our governor that you know, I feel very strongly should commission a statewide you know, commission on homelessness to look at it from all aspects of who we are as humans and how we 
live and policies and how it impacts who we are. So, you know, you're sitting here representing one department. So thank you for that. But what about everybody else? Like, what does that look like? I feel like this, this puzzle is not complete and I don't understand how it works. And um, I'm feeling very lost. Even when you're explaining these rules, I'm a very educated individual and I have absolutely no idea what you said about 80 days and being left and coming back and adverse weathers, like my brain was going to explode. And so what about someone who doesn't have the resources? When you're homeless, you do not have the capability of executive functioning to make good decisions. And this is, I think, just a, a cycle of just a really bad policy decision. And I would urge I want you to tell us how to urge our government to make decisions and what can we do to to help support our community because I will I will do anything in my power to to make some changes. Thank you. I really appreciate that question. Um, the, the GA rules, the, the, the program are handed changes every single year. So it's hard to administer and even harder for those who are in the program to understand. Yeah. So it takes a lot of communication. We've not always been great at that. We're trying to get, get better at that. It's absolutely not just a DCF issue. Everybody thinks of DCF. We're supposed to be the safety net. It's much, much deeper than that. Uh, there are other departments doing things. Um, Department of Mental Health, um, the Vermont Department of Health, Corrections, Department of Aging and Independent Living, um, all have hands in this. And, um, populations that cross all, all boundaries. Uh, there is a, a governor's council on housing and homelessness. Um, it was created last year. They, they did put forth some recommendations for the legislature. Uh, some of them were taken up, some, some weren't. Uh, they have three subcommittees. One is special populations. So what are the, the populations that have different, uh, more complex needs? One is supports and services. And the other is unit generation. So it's housing and homelessness kind of going hand in hand. Um, they'll make more recommendations at the end of this year for the legislature as well. Uh, it is, it's, it's, there's no one simple solution. Uh, you can't just throw money at the problem. The GA hotel program has been, I think, a convenient way to, to catch people. Um, but in catching them, they're often um, kind of isolated and put away in, in these other departments and DCF and providers and everyone can kind of say, oh, they're okay for now. And, and, and they don't always move forward. They don't always get the services they need. So I think there's consensus on moving away from GA, but to the, to the points everyone is making here tonight, like what is, what is the alternative until we get housing is the, the thing that everyone is struggling with. Um. Joe, drop that door open. Hold the meeting and it's locked. Is it locked? Yeah. Jody. We'll take a minute. I did not hear you. Okay. No, that's good. I just said your name once. So that's okay. okay. Hi, Jody Pedersen from Freedom Drive. I had a couple of questions. The first one was similar to something Adrian just said. I didn't understand the the eighty day cutoff. Are they allowed to be housed again on twelve one, even if they've met their they've already used their eighty days? That's my first part of my question. Second is, I was wondering if you knew that what the local churches in Montpelier are doing. They've adopted unhoused families or people, and there's people who have written checks for 1,000, 500 individual people who are throwing money into the pot to house these people until December 1st. And the third comment I have is, if the state were to open a shelter over in, say, Waterbury at the Armory, would they make sure they also provided busing so that the um, residents could, you know, get into Montpelier to to get meals or 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 that kind of thing? And I think that's it. 
Thank, and thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jody. Um, the 80 days does not uh, count against your time between December 1st and April 1st. So it's, it's totally separate. The 80 days does run in a calendar year. So whenever you first start using your 80 days, you have a full 80 days in that calendar year, exclusive of the time between December 1st and April 1st. <laughs> um, I had heard something about the local churches keeping people housed um, and, and others was, was speaking to that earlier, kind of the, the, the generosity there is, is really amazing. Um, and then I'm sorry, what was your third question? <clears throat> I didn't write it down. Transportation, yes. Uh, transportation, yes transportation. Is, is always a part of the planning for any shelter to make sure people can get to services. Um, if we're doing a family shelter in Waterbury or Montpelier or somewhere else, um, uh, school consideration would come into account if they're not in that community, even if they are in that community, getting kids to and from school, getting folks to and from uh, medical appointments hopefully bringing a number of services on site to make it even more convenient for people to um, to connect and get what they need. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've invited, specially invited a number of people here who, for their expertise uh, and their involvement in the in the situation. So I'd like to call on some of those people who are, who are here who'd like, to, if they have comments at this point, we have, We've invited members of our homelessness task force to be here. And I wonder if there's someone here who would like to, uh, from the homelessness task force, would like to speak up. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Don't leave. Don't leave. Yeah. Don't leave. I'll be right here. Is that okay? <laughs> Perfect. Zach, here's it. Uh, Zach Hughes again, uh, District Three, Montpelier, and um, and I'll remind you to keep your you really belt it out. I'm gonna try. Yep. Okay. Only to yell at you. No, yeah. Right. Don't don't I, feel bad if you're yelling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll well, try. All right. Um, so we're here. Um, your homelessness task force. It's great to meet with you all. Uh, been five years. Uh, doing different things, uh, taking some positives and some criticisms. I am here tonight, not as a representative of any service provider, but of my fellow citizenry of the city of Montpelier. I do not get paid to be here, uh, nothing like that. I want to clear that up right now, and I know you all are. And I, so I want to get down to it. We started out five years ago around this time. And it was supposed to be a work group, as I understood it, where we're gonna come back and give y'all some recommendations on some issues appearing in our city that were concerning at the time. We have continued uh, as a task force almost each week, every month, uh, almost every couple of, you know, and we are working diligently with what we are also handed as far as, you know, constraints. We, uh, we are grateful to have this opportunity tonight and we are going to tell you through our, through people here who are gonna speak what uh, we are interested in. Um, we are very interested in coming up with ideas together. Uh, and we've said that five years ago, uh, but we, I think the reality is we are confronted with a very serious situation. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, some of the stuff that we want to be able to do uh, jointly is, you know, look at that encampment policy again. Um, we, um, and we want to be able to provide more, uh, you know, transparency and communication uh, with y'all, um, you know, and, you uh, so I really just think it's really important to understand we are here for you as resources and uh, we intend to continue to carry out what, what y'all are uh, looking for and also what we're looking for and we are always gonna come back here to do that. Um, 
And I just wanted to acknowledge some, uh, I know people felt that there's some tension uh, between us and the city. And I, I think that's because we know there's some issues going on and we are trying diligently to uh, get this, uh, you know, get the support needed for everybody. And there are perceptions out there that are concerning and that, that happens. But if we can work together, that is what we want to be able to continue to do. Um, I just want to also give some positives that we've done over the five years. We did work with the city around certain ideas, uh, you know, around, uh, and we weren't able to do it because we didn't have a provider to run the, uh, the idea. Um, so, I mean, the reality of it is um, we want to give you the information so that y'all can act. I um, leave you um, with one question and for Commissioner Winters to bring back to state. Why is it that we had four years? We knew we didn't know we had four years, but we had a significant amount of time to <laughs> figure this out. Crisis ends usually, we know, that COVID was gonna to come to a club. And yet, what was really done? What, where are we at now? Did we make necessary policy changes? And, or were we using the hotel program as a placeholder temporarily? And I, I may be speaking on my own terms here a little bit, but I think it represents the questions that we've asked. And this was a this has been a unique opportunity. So it's great the governor formed that uh, council. But what happened in the four years that we sit in Zoom meetings and come up with ideas and we couldn't execute them? Uh, we're spending fifty million dollars a year. That could have been used probably for housing. We could have done it. But anyway, I appreciate your time this evening. I did have some notes, but my colleagues. We'll talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. <clears throat> and do you have someone who you think should be up next? I uh, call up uh, Tori. Okay. You want to call up someone? You got Because we just had the question about. Um, really excellent church, uh, question about what the churches are doing. I want to turn over the mic to um, Beth Ann Mayer and um, the Chief Voorhees. Um, Beth Ann, because she took the lead in organizing faith communities when it was clear that the exit was going to happen, and the immediate response of all the people who gathered was, What can we do? There was no, we don't have the resources. There was no, this is not our responsibility. It's up to somebody else. People were, we can have people sleep in the churches um, and many other things, which Beth Ann could tell you about. Um, and Jay Voorhees is a relatively new um, pastor in town who um, carried a lot of the work on behalf of unhoused people in Nashville for many years and may also have something to share. Great. I'd love to talk later if I get a chance, but this is important. So. Thanks. Come on up. Hi, I'm Beth Ann Mayer. I can usually talk pretty loud. <laughs> um, and the church, downtown churches in Montpelier came together and the generosity has been incredible. I think it's close to 50 people have raised a sum of money that's been keeping at this point, uh, seven families who have children in the Montpelier schools, in the hotels, uh, being in the hotels is obviously not a great place for families. Uh, you know, I've been one of the families we've been connected with that we're supporting has three children and a mom in a hotel room with two queen beds, uh, eating from a microwave and a, and a mini fridge. And, but that's better than the alternative of having them camping outside. So we are paying $70 a night to the hotel owners for each room for people uh, as they are needing to exit uh, until December 1st. We have a 
a pregnant mom who's delivering next week, um, who would otherwise be out in a tent uh, and returning to a tent after her newborn is born. Uh, but we're keeping her in. But this, this will have shot our wad. I mean, there is not going to be another fundraising effort like this in March. Um, and it'll take another year or two for people to really be able to come forth with that kind of generosity. So this is not something that's going to be sustainable, but it was something that we needed to do to meet a crisis. Um, I'm also very involved in the meals that were mentioned um, that happen cr at Christ Church. Hopefully they'll be moving over to Trinity uh, when Trinity gets its electricity back. But uh, in the meantime, all of the different churches are offering the meal out of Christ Church. And uh, as Mimi Clark said, you know, the group has been amazing in terms of the just the uh, coming together as a group and being able to lean on each other and uh, and mixing with many people who are housed in the community who use the meals for fellowship and for the food they need. So it's become a, a great group. Uh, I will say that in the last month, we were, we were serving 60 to 70 meals a day. And in the last month that's gone up to 90 to 100. Uh, and it's mostly, and we're seeing a lot of new faces who are living outside. So these are people who have come to the community, uh, having been exited, I believe, from hotels. Um, the one point I wanted to make is just the citizenry of Montpelier really seems to want to do something. Uh, the meals are staffed by uh, anywhere from eight to 10 volunteers a day. So that's 40 to, 40 to 50 people who are showing up every week to make and serve these meals. And then people are giving to this effort. So there is a huge desire by the citizenry to do something. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Jay? Good evening. My name is Jay Voorhees. I am the pastor of Trinity United Methodist Church. I'm also a resident in District 1. Good to see y'all. Um, I had a couple of questions for Chris. I think one of the things that I'm not hearing is what the relationship with the Department of Her uh, Housing and Urban Development is. And the reason I ask that is because I know in Nashville, where I just came from, uh, we had a very tight relationship. We had a HUD technical assistant that was making recommendations along the way of how Nashville could respond. Um, part of that led to the installation of what we called a, a mobile housing navigation center in the church that I served at the time, which was a 15 bed transitional living unit staffed with two case managers with the goal of moving folks into permanent housing you know, as Nashville had a housing shortage as well. So they originally were very optimistic and saying 30 to 90 days, and it was more like a year. Um, but we saw 50 to 60% of those residents that came to live with us end up moving into permanent housing and, and finding stability. And so uh, the question for me is, where are we in conversation with housing and urban development about those kinds of issues? One of the reasons they chose faith communities to locate what are now, I think, six um, uh, of these housing centers was because the federal RELUPA laws allow faith communities to do things that are outside of, the, as long as it's consistent with their mission, the zoning laws do not apply. Internal codes laws apply, but zoning laws do not apply according to the federal law. And so that gives the faith communities a little bit more perspective, uh, ability to um, ramp up and be able to do those things. It, it really required a partnership between government and the faith communities to do it. We couldn't have done it on our own. 
the, the government provided the staffing and the, uh, the uh, financial support for a provider that provided staffing. They also provided some uh, building renovation money to allow for uh, it to come up with codes, but it, w- it worked and um, it was fairly successful in Nashville. The community that I served, the neighborhood of Nashville I served, uh, had a population about the size of Burlington's and had a homeless population within just that community of about 500 people. Um, we had a definite need, just like we have here, but we were looking for solutions. And I don't claim that Nashville has it all solved because they don't. Okay. Uh, Milwaukee did a much better job. But um, again, part of what I'm hearing from the state level is, well, we've got these boundaries, but I'm not hearing about these other, just kind of what Councilman Gill said, uh, Councilperson Gill said, I'm not hearing about this kind of broader conversation with the feds and other funding streams to be able to try to help us. So thank Thanks. you for your time. Thank you. Do you have an answer? Yeah, I can just say that. It didn't Why don't you get up to the... Sure. Yep. Sorry to keep making no, people okay. move. But... Um, we do receive HUD funding. We do have a, a relationship with housing and ur- urban development. Uh, we meet occasionally with um, the Interfaith Action Group. Um, and understand that you know what used to be a lot of shelters and church basements are just not possible either with you know the complexity of the population or the uh, number of, of volunteers who are available to do that work. It's and really appreciate the work that um, churches and uh, other folks in those communities do. Uh, I can't speak very specifically to what we what our relationship with HUD is like, but I'm happy to connect with you afterward. So, uh, and talk. Do you have some ideas about how we could potentially partner? Thanks. Um, I know we. Oh, come on up. Yeah. Perfect timing for that. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Meredith Warner. I'm the interim co chair of the Homelessness Task Force. I'm interim co chair of the Homelessness Task Force. And uh, I'm here to follow up on some of the things that Zach shared. And um, I'm also a staff person and a deputy director at Good Samaritan Haven. And I'm being really transparent and clear about that because my role in the task force is complicated by that. I think it's really important that service providers participate and are part of the task force. But of course, I wanna be transparent about my relationship with that. And so I'm gonna read from you a document that we discussed at our meeting this morning at 1130. Uh, and and uh, hopefully some of my task force members who are here will also follow up if I miss anything. So- I'll ask for a show of hands. In the back, is is it loud enough or do you need it to be louder? It's not loud enough. Uh-huh. Okay. okay, thanks. Um, so- So last week, the Homelessness Task Force sent a memo to uh, City Council and to the mayor uh, expressing uh, a a past motion uh, that was part of that meeting. And I'm just going to read that aloud. It says, our community unified must continue to advocate for the state to reinstate the motel program to pre-July 2024 levels. This will allow time to develop a new sustainable plan to shelter our most vulnerable neighbors. Congregant shelters, like those stood up in, during previous motel exits, are not a viable interim solution. So that was one of the things that we would love to see the council to support. Uh, we would also love to see the council, uh, you know, we are under uh, an understanding that the council is under considerable pressure financially from two years of flooding, right? So, and part of the budget cuts impacted the ways in which homelessness is supported in our community. And we would love to see a restoration of uh, previous levels of support. And if that means asking the state for those resources because of that, that interplay of how resources are, we are now spending more resources as a city to support our uh, unsheltered and sheltered homeless population. We think that's an appropriate request. Um, We're also interested in a conversation with the state about how we shift what we do to a public health response instead of to just a public safety response. We're interested in uh, street outreach programs, but especially with collaborations with some of our partners in public, uh, or sorry, in uh, healthcare, uh, possibly a medical uh, mobile unit 
um, support for substance use and mental health care, uh, and, and, it, and really looking at harm reduction strategies to mitigate risk and improve health outcomes. We have great partners uh, in Central Vermont. We have uh, Central Vermont Medical Center. We also have the People's Health and Wellness uh, Clinic. So we have great partners, we think, here that could support some of those requests. And we'd love to see the state partner with us on some of those ideas. Um, the rest really has to do more with the recommendations to the council, I think, around um, other things the city could explore in terms of housing opportunities like single room, uh, single room occupancy, really diversifying our housing uh, units. But I think that's less of a request to the state than it is so much to share along with you. So those are the ones I'm going to pass along. Uh, and I'm going to ask um, any other members here to come forward if I've missed anything. I edited out just what I thought was at Tori and Bev and those of you who are here online to just um, help me if you feel like there's anything that fell more into the uh, state looking rather than the council looking ideas that we talked about today. Uh, and I thank you. And, <laughs> and one last thing too is to just say that you've all read the memo that we sent. We offered the idea of a public health emergency or a declaration of a state of emergency by the state. Um, and we also would love to see an opportunity for more uh, safe camping locations. So the state has land. Uh, some of that land in Montpelier used to be available to campers, and it is no longer. Um, and so that would be another potential request that we could, I think, think of the state itself for it. Uh, not that I don't personally think camping it should be discussed as a viable option. However, unfortunately, that's where we're at. And if that's where we're at, uh, how can the state support that need for space? Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. Anyone from the housing or for homelessness task force that wants to be heard that has not been heard from yet. Okay, one of the one of the categories that we invited here, and I know there's some time constraints, but we invited our uh, members of our, uh, our legislative delegation to come. <clears throat> and I know we have uh, Senators uh, Watson, Perchlick, and Cummings. Uh, should we said that in reverse order? Representative Casey. Do you have anything that you can bring to us? So thanks very much, uh, City Council, for bringing us all together today. I think it's an important discussion. It's probably long overdue. Um, I want to preface this by saying I have tremendous respect for the commissioner. Uh, I think he's a really good man. And uh, a tremendous respect for the uh, staff at the uh, uh, DCF there. Uh, all of state governments working tremendously on the staff with I think almost a thousand vacancies in state government last time I checked there. So there's a lot of people from lines doing the hard work. And I want to thank everybody in the audience here uh, who's working for providers and also doing the really hard work. But I, I think we need to talk about how we got here and then what we do going forward. And uh, I, I would push back on I think how it's been characterized that the administration has been given this budget by the legislature and they're working the best they can to do it through no fault of their own. The budget is inherently a compromised document. And uh, even though we may have a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate there, um, we realize that almost everything we do, we're looking down the barrel of a veto gun here. And, uh, you know, we, when we started with the administration, what they offered us instead of the 80 days cap was a 28 days cap. So we negotiated. Unless you're able to convince 99 of your buddies to go the same way you are, you're left with a budget compromise. And I think if you talk to leadership, if you talk to anybody, we made the mistake of having too much faith in this administration to be creative and put ideas on the table that would get us out of this. Um, and I think many of us, myself included, are ashamed that we supported this and had this faith in the administration because you didn't have to be Nostradamus a few years ago to see that we would be where we are now, right? Uh, we had this discussion a couple of years ago when many of us voted against the budget uh, and we're adamantly against the uh, abolishment of the hotel voucher program. So, so we are where we are. And, uh, you know, I, I think a budget is a statement of your values. And Governor Scott has preached an austerity budget. In fact, you can hear him on the radio, on TV right now, blaming the legislature for raising too much money, too much money. 
So like anybody who looks you in the eye and says, we're gonna get out of this without spending a ton of money is lying to you, right? We need to make substantial investments in this to help out our municipalities, our providers who are underpaid and overworked, and we're not willing to do that. And this, this is what Vermont is right now. Vermont is somebody with an, on a ventilator looking for an outlet near a pillar on City Hall so they can breathe. Vermont is the woman I spoke to at the hilltop who had had a horrible life and didn't even have the like cognitive abilities to go out and get food for herself. She relied on the good same staff to do this and she was pushed out on the street. So if we look at this, look in the mirror, this is the society that we have created collectively and, and we all own it to some extent. Um, so going forward, I don't even think you need to be compassionate for this population to realize that what we're doing is terrible right now. Um, because if you're a taxpayer in Montpelier, Barry, any of the other population centers, uh, sure, you might not want us to raise taxes at the state level, but you're going to be paying for it anyways. It's a cost shift to communities, and you're going to be paying for it anyways. And what's this administration thought? Like, when you come to them with flood relief, when you come to them with anything, sell some license plates, have a lemonade stand or something, let the private sector chip in and do the right thing. Well, everybody's tapped. And you know what? Like, taxes are a dirty word, but we can raise revenue on people making over $500,000 a year. We absolutely can do that. Because the option otherwise is people dying in the dark on our bike paths like they're going to do this winter. This is ridiculous. The shelters we're setting up right now are, I'm on the Institutions Committee. It's uh, the state police barracks, which are using the store equipment right now. The old armory. Again, I'm on institutions on the rep from Montpelier. There's been no conversation with me that we're even using a state office building right now for shelters. And the snow is about to fall. So the only thing we should be talking about doing right now is either A, uh, bringing back the hotel voucher program to its full capacity, unless we have some good ideas and are willing to put some money into this. Um, we should definitely be listening to everybody here, uh, but we can't go on like this, or the governor should call us back in the session and we'll do the work that he obviously is it able or not willing to do? Again, it's not with the commissioner, it's not with the departments, it starts at the top. And you'll see in the next few weeks, a uh, budget instruction document will go out to every department and state government. And you can bet your baby that document is gonna tell them all to cut your department's budget by about 3%. Even if you left it even, right? Even if you left it even with inflation, it's still gonna be cuts to every department and state government. So if we're happy with this as a situation that we're living in, that's great. Let's just go on as planned here. Let's do these makeshift shelters. Let's put people out of the street and let's leave them for dead. But I think we're better than that. And I think we all should be following the solutions of the Homelessness Task Force with Ms. Warner just sat here and listening and investing a ton of money to get us out of this. He's just letting the clock run out. It's just going to leave a bunch of people with toe tags. So, um, yeah, I, I get a bit worked up on this. You, you talk to people. These are real people, real lives. It's not just numbers on a spreadsheet. And a lot of them grew up in Montpelier. We have a responsibility to do this. If we gotta raise revenue, we gotta do that. Because if we just cut somewhere else in the budget, we're cutting from the actual programs that look at the core roots of homelessness, mental health, substance abuse. We gotta raise revenue. We, 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 gotta, we gotta be willing to do the hard work here, so. Connor, I, I agree with you completely. Uh, do you see any... Uh... <laughs> Do you see any prospects for uh, getting anything in a Budget Adjustment Act? Uh, I, I'm sure, I'm sure the, you know, I've spoken to leadership, but Speaker Kowinski's um, been excellent on this. You know, uh, Teresa Wood from House Human Services has always been like a caseworker in many regards. I, I'm, I'm sure there'll be money shuffled around. It's not going to be enough, you know, it's not going to be enough. We got to raise revenue. That's Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Anybody want to follow that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Senator uh, Watson, are you looking to Senator Watson? Because I understand that you need to, I understand that uh, some of you need to leave, so. Yes, thank you. Gosh, I'm not sure that I can say it any better than Representative Casey. Oh my gosh, thank you. Um, because I I agree. Um, 
I, so I was a part of a group of senators that in the first year of the biennium proposed an amendment to the budget that would have put more money towards homelessness. Unfortunately, that amendment didn't pass. Um, and and the, the deal that I think we were um, given to vote on in the budget um, in the second year of the biennium, I will agree. Like it, 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 I, I, like I feel the weight very much of how this has not worked and that um, it, it, it really bothers me. And it, uh, it's something that I think has to be addressed um, in this, this coming session. So being the solutions oriented person that I am, I am looking for like, what, what do we do? Because I agree there's, it, it really feels like there is this lack of um, a, a comprehensive plan to get us out of this um, at this point. And so, and, and I, I appreciate that there is a, a council on, on homelessness at the state level, um, you know, thinking about what, what would it take to actually solve this in a comprehensive way. And it, I think it is going to take, uh, it, it is going to take money. So, uh, you know, at the risk of, of repeating things that um, uh, Representative Casey said, uh, the, the solutions that um, that I ha have um, in mind at, at the moment are, I, so first of all, I really appreciate that you all came up with a list of recommendations. I thought that was very helpful. Um, particularly, um, I, I think there's a value in there um, that uh, that the uh, the state really needs to take ownership um, of the responsibility for um, folks who are ex experiencing homelessness, and and I appreciated that it was linked to um, your recommendation about supporting municipalities who are providing those services. And I think I, I think that's right on. I think as we're looking at the scope of what homelessness costs, I think. Um, it would be easy to try to outsource or externalize the cost to the state, uh, which, which is to say that municipalities pick up um, extra costs. And I want to be conscious of, of those and that uh, Montpelier, but not, not just Montpelier, are, um, are dealing with that, uh, that burden. And, and so I would, um, on my list is to include, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we adequately compensate municipalities for the, what they are spending to address homelessness? Um, and then, uh, you know, thinking about uh, the eligibility requirements, um, it's it is just it, it feels absolutely inhumane to put people out on the street who are pregnant, who have children, who are coming out of surgery, who are um, seniors, who have disabilities. Right? These, this is this is the you know what kind of society you know it has to do with what kind of society we are willing to. Um, live with what kind of society we want to build. Um, and certainly the society that we are living with right now where we're putting these folks out on the street is not, um, it, it does not feel acceptable to me. So that becomes a, an issue of prioritization, you know, in terms of uh, if we don't, if we're not able to raise revenue, how we prioritize um, funding for uh, homelessness uh, services moving on into the future. And I think it would be best if we could raise revenue. Um, so those are, th those are the things that rise to the top for me. And I think it's, it's worth noting that, and I, I'm not familiar enough with the um, projections around this, but thinking about how it is expensive to put people out on the street, right? Like that, that is going to ultimately cost society more uh, in terms of Medicaid, in terms of uh, uh, medical costs and um, you know, costs that would otherwise be avoidable if we were to if we were able to keep people in homes in the first place. Um, so if if we can uh, recognize that those that prioritizing keeping people in homes has um, financial dividends, you know, as, aside from the fact that it's just inhumane, that it is going to pay for itself. Um, I think it's something that we need to um, recognize and, and work uh, work on as as reasoning for um, prioritizing homelessness um, moving forward. And then, you know, to, on on top of that, I guess I would say uh, it, it's hard to not have a conversation about housing in general um, in talking about homelessness. I mean, there the need for more housing comes up over and over again in a variety of different um, sectors for different reasons. And homelessness is certainly um, is certainly one of them and ensuring that we have um, affordable uh, places to live uh, is, is critical. So uh, I, I feel like those are parallel um, 
problems and, and solutions there. So thank you um, all for, for raising this. Thank you for having this meeting. I um, am looking forward to advocating with my colleagues in the Senate um, further about this um, in the coming session because where, where we're at right now is unacceptable. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm Andrew, firstly, thanks for having this. This is our, your work that you have been doing over the last couple of years, dealing with this struggles. Um, second one, Representative Casey basically said, I think in particular, it's been very aggravating to hear the governor and the governor's spokespeople try to push this off the bottom. That was the legislature's plan. Um, that's really frustrating also that he's going around the state campaigning against incumbents when we made a deal on this and on other, other issues. So he's going around the state and saying the, these, this legislature's spending too much money, taxing you too high, you have to vote them out. But at the same time saying, hey, they didn't give us enough money. They made us do this, so we can't, this is all we can do. So I think the council is right to look to the state this, the city only has so much taxing authority, only so much tax base. This, these are statewide issues, and the state has the ability to, to raise revenue in different ways. I agree with Senator Watson and Representative Casey there. He, the House already did this last year, where they passed a tax on those that made over $500,000, and all that money was going to go to more affordable housing and shelters and long term housing. Because in my mind, this. The problem is housing, so we got to build more houses, and then we have to build more houses and build more houses. And we're only going to do that with a bunch of money that goes to the HCB and the shelters and everybody else that, that has been working on this. Uh, but the governor did attack the house for doing that and said that you shouldn't be raising taxes. So that, that's a difficulty when you're on the ground trying to work on the solution by being attacked by the governor and going to forums where people are saying, well, the governor said that you guys are just raising too much taxes and you don't care about poor people. You don't care about you know, those in the community that can't handle all these taxes. On the same side, the governor gets elected overwhelmingly and likes to tout that he's the most popular governor in the country. So part of it is what we, what do we want to do as a society and do we want to raise this revenue for housing? I'm willing to raise revenue for housing and do it over like a five to 10 year plan because we need, we can't just put more money into the budget adjustment act and think that's going to, you know, put into the pipeline. We're going to end up with enough housing or shelters to solve the problem. But if basically the plan that the house passed that we have money for the next 10 years, that's going to build a substantial amount of housing across the state in enough for the different needs. There's different types of housing that fill all the different niches. And so I, that's the main thing that I'm hoping to work on, as well as this other stuff. I, I think this, the legislature, we did have some, uh, you know, maybe Representative Casey said, like, trust that the, the, the administration would be able to manage this in a way that was, was going to work. I mean, that was the kind of the plan back then when, when we passed it. We thought that it would work. Maybe that was magical thinking, and we, we should have known better than to do that. But we're also working within that budget framework that we have. And all I can do is promise to try to try to do better next time, uh, work with the rest of the legislature, uh, hope to work with the administration. And I asked the second one, I think what Representative Casey said about Commissioner Winters, I think they're good people that they're including Commissioner Winters and that they're trying, they care. They also think it's horrible that we're putting these people on the street. So we can work with them on a better solution. And I think there is a way to get there, but it's it's not gonna be easy and there's gonna be some difficult times. You know, even when we had more hotel rooms, we were putting people out on the street. There's just a really tremendous problem that we have to deal with. But I agree that the state should be helping cities like Montpelier and other to make that happen. Happy to work with you guys. Thanks. Senator Cummings, bring bring up the rear. Heading clean up.
Thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. I'm going to try and eat this microphone because I haven't heard a thing in the back of the room. It's, it's not it's, amplifying in the room. It's just so, taping. So okay. belt it out. I won't do it. I will talk. My dog training voice. Um, <laughs> I'll tell everyone to sit. Um, this is a the only major issue that did go through my committee, so I haven't been in the center of the discussion. But my committee does raise revenue. Um, I will also tell you going around that affordability is an issue for people, just the price of groceries, the price of rent, the increase in property taxes. There's a lot of residents out there with people that are very concerned about their ability to afford to continue to live here. I saw a statistic that said half our households are uh, headed by someone who is 55 years or older. That means you're either retired or you're looking at retirement and your earning days are over. Our deaths are outnumbering our births by, I think, it's several thousand. We need 9,000 people to move in here a year to stay even. And we don't have 9,000 houses for those people. We need those people. We need the mental health workers. We need um, the social workers. We need everybody. So we've got ourselves in a very just whirlpool where we've got one issue and most of these are federal issues. Everybody has a housing crisis in this country. Uh, everybody has a homelessness crisis. I think, yes, it is unconscionable that we are putting people out on the street. It is unconscionable that we have chronically underfunded home health service, uh, all those community-based services. The governor level funded them all again all this year. Uh, my committee was asked to raise money so we could give them a glorious 3% raise in this kind of an inflationary. And we did it. Uh, we need those services. My committee's job is to raise the revenue. And I think we could raise the revenue. We could do a surcharge on the income tax to address housing. We've been told we need $100 million a year to, to catch up, we could do that. Um, but I've also been told that we can tax the same people to provide a tuitionless college, to provide single payer health care, to fix the homeless crisis, to uh, provide paid family leave. We're going to have to make choices because we haven't got that many rich people and we already have the second highest tax rate on that bracket of any other state in the country. We are one quarter of a percent below the imaginary, the, you know, we always hear about Massachusetts just put a five or four percent surcharge. They're now paying nine, we're paying eight and three quarters. Um, so, you know, th there's, there's some limits as to how much we can raise. Half the people in that top tax bracket won't be in there next year. Usually it's because they sold a business, they've spent their life building, and this is their retirement. Um, so there's some concern about do we take their retirement money when we don't tax your IRA until you take it down, you spend it. Um, so there are limits, but I and we're going to have to set those priorities. I think that's where it's going to take local officials saying, this is what, oh, and we also have flood recovery. Um, when we, we did a waterfall because revenues came in ahead of forecast, and those are the choices. You put so much into flood recovery and so much into um and the, this all got done in appropriations. It, it gets, there are compromises met. But 
most compromises. Nobody's happy. Um, the homeless issue, I think we have listened to the governor for four years and um, we've been being told all hands on deck, we've got this under control, not to worry. And then three weeks later, we found out we should have worried. Um, and it, it's going to take all of us to say, this is what we need to do this year. This is what our plan is. We need to help the towns come together and say, okay, we passed the um, housing uh, bill last year that said towns can't deny having shelters downtown in their towns. We have towns that won't let you put a shelter in. Um, all the towns took care of their homeless. Montpelier probably wouldn't have the, you know, the number that they do do. And we have a thousand more homeless people now than we did when we were doing the um, winter hotel program. So that number has grown. I think the property tax and the rent increases are going to push that number up as people wow. get priced out of the house, you know, the housing market. So say is I share your frustration. I'm a fixer by nature. I like to fix problems. And this is one there is this is one of many this year that there are no easy fixes for. And it will take all of us coming together and focusing and deciding this is where we're going to focus. This is where we're going to concentrate. This is where we're going to raise the money. Because if three city councils from now, we come in and say, oh yes, we're gonna come up with all this money to help you do flood recovery, raise downtown up six feet, we can't do it. No matter how many rich people we tax, we just don't have that many. And we'll probably have fewer if, if we tax them more. I think we will do a second home tax this year. I, I'm looking into doing some kind of rent control or allowing towns that you need our permission to do something like that and under certain circumstances. I at least think it needs to be discussed. But then you would agree that given all the difficulties you mentioned about the, uh, about raising revenue we just can't do this without money right no like a lot more money than we're like a lot more money than now. we have yeah. yeah and there are a lot of issues i have never seen people in vermont between the back-to-back -back flooding i don't have to tell anyone here what we all do when it starts to rain um, the, the stress, I go into grocery store and I used to feed a family of six for less than I'm feeding two of us right now. And we're eating essentially the same thing, chicken and hamburger. Uh, and that's lucky you can afford that. There are people, you know, I went to the farmer's market, it was $7 for a tomato. People can't afford that. The wages haven't gone up. So the stress out there between food uh, and everyone keeps saying you keep raising my taxes. Well, I did put a slight increase in the payroll tax to subsidize childcare, um, which we hear is being successful. But other than that, the only tax that's gone up is the property tax. And that's because people vote to spend more. Um, and yeah, we've got to get that under control too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, now we have some providers here um, who've been working day in and day out with uh, unhoused uh, community members. Is there anyone here who has gone up? And thanks for being here.
there. All right. I'm Julie Bond, Executive Director of Good Samaritan Haven. Um, I really just want to know what questions you have <laughs> because that's why I'm here. I just want to converse. So. Oh, we've got a question right off so, the bat. <laughs> well, I, um, I was talking to Chris and asking about um, training service providers, importing service providers, finding more service providers. It sounds like it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big part of any solution that we come up with, and we're, we're really short. And we never really got to talk about that. Um, what, what, are, what are we doing? What, what can we do to, to help that situation? It's a good question. I mean, you know, there's complexities to having folks um, come from out of state, you know, it's just, I, you know, I don't really have amazing answers about that kind of thing. We do, we try to recruit people mm. every day for the current, you know, local populations um, for the workforce. Um, that's been our preference all along. Are there, are there, uh, are there um, special qualifications? I mean, are, 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 do, do people require very specific kind of training or is it something that nope, can be just provided to, to care and locally. serve the mission mm. you know i i ask all the time in in any of these meetings as well as any any place that i am to come join us yeah. be part of the solution um you don't need a, a huge amount of training or education just a lot of heart and to be present with it to follow up with a couple of questions do you have vacancies now? And do you have clients you're working with who might be good prospects for uh, working for you? I do have several major vacancies in the organization, which is hindering our ability to, you know, increase our scope of work or maintain our scope of work. Um, I, there's a there's a a process that we engage in for those who have uh, been part of our our guest population um, in terms of boundaries and how I work with that um, and how long one has to be away from our shelter and uh, housed before they can uh, work in the shelter. Yeah, Commissioner Winters said. Uh, well, it seems like a long time ago now, but, but said that uh, one of the things they're looking at is as they look at uh, opening up uh, state-owned buildings in Montpelier is staffing. If if the, if they gave you a building today, would you have the resources to staff it? And if they gave you the money, they put us there. Yeah. No, yeah. If, if, if the funding was taken care of. That may exist. Uh, the human bodies might not exist. Right? So um, there's lots of complexities. It's not just as easy as saying if we build it, they will come kind of, you know, such a new situation. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot to to, you know, when an organization grows like this, so precipitously because of need, and you have an administration down here and you go like that, you can very easily topple. So you have to be very careful in terms of sustainability and how you do that and how you decide to do that and what the decisions about our, our scope of work, our, our strategic planning, you know, our ability to, to administer our organization safely and sustainably would be. So, um, yes, I mean, we're, we're grateful that there's all these ideas coming from the state, uh, you know, to try to build out shelter capacity and to do that in a way that, you know, is, is less of a congregate shelter type of scenario. We're, we're trying to really avoid that. Um, so we're, we're excited about those possibilities, it, but it takes time. Right, mm -hmm. it's still not a quick solution um, to to outfit spaces that have you know had habitability requirements. You know, it's still there's that still exists. Um, so 
so there's those pieces. And I think I've said all along, it would be very beneficial to continue a parallel process of continuing the, the motel program as we are also building shelter capacity. It just simply has to span beyond budget cycles. It simply does. I'm tired of, of being bound by budget cycles. It's a, it's a self-defeating process, okay? Because we need to build across time and space Right. Um, none of this will get solved unless we can continue to parallel things and not bring humans to a, a cliff, a precipice, you know, um, while we're trying to solve something that, that takes time. You know, shelter is the same as regular affordable housing as, as well as commercial housing. It, like it's, it all takes time. So, um, I, you know, it, the answer is very complex, you know, if, if the building is there, it, like, yes, it's very exciting to be able to serve and, and carry out our mission in multiple ways. And if we could, yes, we'd have a dozen shelters if we could, you know, but that it's, that's not, that's not the, the answer, you know, like that's, there's a lot to that. So I could go on for days about, you know, all of that. But, yeah. and, and do you have an opinion about things like these uh, pallet shelters and whether that would be a workable uh, approach for us here in the I do have my own opinions about pallet shelters and I do not support them myself. I don't think that it's, um, I don't think it's an easy thing to manage. Uh, if I were to have to manage it, it would be a very, very complex thing in my opinion. Um, it's, it's, Inordinately difficult enough to to run the shelters the way they're traditionally set up, um, you know. So I I don't I don't also like the size. It doesn't feel humane to me. Um, the size of those kinds of shelters. There's there's a lot that I don't personally. It's my personal. Opinion. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Any other council members? Or any question at this point? Thanks so much for being here. Yes. One question, and it, this question kind of came up to Chris earlier, but, out, but so one of the one of the things that you all had asked was that the um, community consider declaring a public health emergency. Like, do you know that that like that could send a signal of how serious we're taking the problem? Is there? I don't think that that for the city level accesses any new resources or anything. I think it, it would be more of a statement of urgency and directing the state but is that wrong is there anything that like we're able to do differently by doing that or i mean calling on the state to do it that might access funding streams or the ability to call the national guard and other things has different impacts but i was just curious for that i'm just thinking of like we're we have our state officials here which is great and then also like what can the city do itself and independently that's helpful I mean, that's a good question. I don't, myself, I don't know what those abilities are for a city, you know, to do. Um, you can always get creative and do it. Why not? Like, I don't see why there's an inability to do that. <laughs> I think the city can do it. I just didn't know they were asking. But, the host, yeah. Task Force was asking us too because they knew it would help us I'm access anything. What, yeah, okay. Whether that's a recommendation. I, I just, you know, I think any one of us could set up and say that it is an emergency because it is a crisis. I mean, what we're doing as an organization is trying to literally keep people from dying right now, right? Every single day. So we're triaging those who are coming out of the motels to make sure that, you know, they don't suffocate from lack of oxygen. They don't die from low sugar because they take insulin five times a day and it requires refrigeration. You know, the, they are giving birth and and losing their hotel room two days later. Like there's literal, like the scenarios that we are receiving and having to decide, yes, we will help with our own money, with the monies of the churches and the individuals in the community to raise, right? Um, and to risk our organization's financial well-being in order to do the right thing, to keep people alive. That's what I'm focused on right now. It's 
not allowing me to run the other shelters in the way I would like to, because I'm focused on keeping people alive. <laughs> so, you know, this is, it's super complex what's happening. And um, I don't, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of opportunity to continue to do the right thing and continue to do that in a parallel way that we can we'll solve at shelter capacity, but also re remove these 10 week windows of time where folks need to, to leave uh, spaces that already exist. And there's no ramp up time, ramp down time to, to get people to just stay put. Um, the same thing's gonna happen in the spring if we do not do this and nobody has any 80 days left. <laughs> so, so it starts, you know, up to uh, April 1st with zero days until, until you know, July 1st. So, so that to me is, is almost more of a, <laughs> a danger in a way, uh, but there's a lot to it. Yes. Wait a minute, oh. Matt, sorry, Tori. I need to have you come up okay. to the microphone. I, I know it's it's up and down a lot, but um, Lauren, with regard to the um, state of emergency um, that the homelessness task force is re really would like to see the city and the state um, declare. Um, Part of how I got involved in this in the first place was that in the late 1980s, I was running a um, grassroots agency down at Brattleboro that was working a lot with the unhoused people living there. And we somehow, I have no idea how, um, ended up being in charge of a bunch of FEMA money for, for um, supporting people in, in motels at, at that time. And pretty much every day we had people calling because there was no room at Morningside Shelter. Um, and the I would if I were in your shoes, one of the things I would look into is whether by any wild, bizarre chance um, having an emergency actually would um, make any FEMA funding available. That that's probably completely out of date information, and I'm sure it wasn't that much to begin with. But I think it's worth asking about. That's Thanks. how I learned the word FEMA, actually. Folks, we've been going a long time. Um, we're right around time for our, uh, oh, Dawn, you've got your hand up. We'll hear from, uh, from you and then we'll take our 10 minute break. Okay, just, um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to sort of emphasize a couple of things that were said earlier, partly by um, Connor Dawn? Casey. And... Are you able to hear me? We're working on it. Sorry. Try now, we, we've turned the volume up. Okay, um, partly wanted to emphasize things that were said earlier by Connor Casey and by Senator Watson, and also by Julie, that the families are not the only people who are very vulnerable. We do have medically vulnerable people out there. And as Meredith said, camping is not an ideal solution, but other solutions take time. And on a daily basis, there are people who have nowhere to go. One of the things that we could use is help with finding spaces for people to camp while we work on the other solutions because we lost a lot of ground with the flooding. Um, and it just comes up daily. It brings people into conflict with other residents. It makes it impossible for them to hold on to what few possessions they have, which they need. Their equipment with the ability to stay warm in the winter we have limited funding for equipment, and if people do not have a stable place to camp and are moving from place to place, their equipment gets stolen, and it's very difficult for us to replenish it. So I just wanted to just wanted to remind people of that, and as a task force member, as Meredith said, having a place for people to go, I don't know if that's something the state could help with or not, um, but I just wanted to remind you again that this is an immediate problem while we think about the ultimate solution, there are people who don't have that time to wait. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Okay, folks, there's more to talk about. Um, we'll take our 10 minute break. See you back here at 8.35. Okay, folks, thanks. Thanks for all for giving your attention again. And I appreciate everyone who, uh, who stuck around after the break. Steve, thank you. Chris, thank you. Um, we've, uh, we're, we've been talking to some providers, uh, Councillor Gill, 
uh, arranged to have some uh, people who work in the health field from from CVH come to talk to us. So I'll pass it along to uh, Adrian to uh, introduce our uh, participants. Yes, thank you. So I, I thought it was important to have representatives from Central Vermont Medical Center. They are an important partner in this extremely complex puzzle. Um, and so I reached out to them and asked for representatives to attend our meeting tonight. And I see they've been on the computer, um, they're on Zoom. So it is, I'm gonna get my notes here. Um, I would like to welcome, if you're available and willing to um, come off mute, Sherry Carr, who is a case management worker at Central Vermont Medical Center, and Kristen Scheiman, who is the ED nurse manager. And so I think it'd be important to hear their perspective from a medical field. Um, they also face lots of challenges that we heard here today. And um, I know that you know, there's opportunities to continue to collaborate and partner. And so I would love to, to hear their, their piece of this puzzle and see um, what questions, concerns they might have and how we can continue to work together. Thanks, Adrian. All right. Are you there? Where are they? Hi, um, this is Sherry Carr. I'm the Director of Care Management at Central Vermont Medical Center. I don't often attend meetings from home. Yes, well, I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Great, thank you. Um, so yes, we are seeing an uptick in homeless patients or unhoused coming into the hospital. Um, a lot of times we're seeing complex medical cases and those are the patients that get um, admitted. We have recently seen um, or of the population of the unhoused um, folks coming in just to seek shelter. Um, um, night or the Lord alone, and Kristen can speak to this also. We had three um, members of the community come into um, the waiting room or the, uh, yeah, the waiting room, I believe the lobby of the ED to just get out of the elements. Um, and this is a little bit newer than normal. Generally, we see the patients coming in and um, but though these folks came in just specifically because they needed to get out of the elements. So this is really completely concerning for us. Um, you know, the ED is a busy, busy place and it's really hard to, you know, we can't admit them without having a diagnosis or a reason, but it's also really hard to see them, you know, failing. And uh, we know that the unhoused population are one of our most vulnerable populations that we see. Uh, and frankly, you know, because so not only are we dealing with being unhoused, they have have issues, they have mental health disorders, they have other complex needs, whether it's oxygen, insulin, um, chronic medical conditions. So we do anticipate that we will see more of these patients because it's it's a perpetual circle, right? Um, if you're unhoused and you're not well, you're going to become unwell well faster so we can fix you but if there is no place where you can go to get adequate um, housing food, food uh, your health care then they'll they'll be back and um, so we're we're not struggling quite yet um, but we have seen you know larger numbers I don't really have a lot of questions um, the information given tonight has been very straightforward um, what we have is really just a lack of resources. So even for the unhoused population, we have a lack, lack of resources for uh, some of the members of our community who are really struggling. That's where you know, you know, our case enhancement point that we, we see these populations and we're doing what we can. We're working hard with our community partners, um, which includes you know, um, the folks down at Good Sam, Dale, DMH, um, Central Vermont Council on Aging, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospital, <clears throat> our community partners that do assisted living and nursing homes. So we're, you know, we're really trying to reach every avenue to help these patients get to the next step. 
Thanks, Sherry. I think I got the gist of it. You were kind of breaking up as you were speaking, so but I think we were able to take in a lot of what you had to say. Um, one of the things that, that that I think about is you're talking to, as we've heard about people being discharged from a hospital to a homeless setting is that I think we've all uh, observed within our own families that uh, the model of how people get health care, get care in hospitals has changed uh, over the years. People are not staying in hospitals uh, nearly as long as they used to, and they're being discharged on the assumption that they'll be they'll be going to some place where they'll have a family member or somebody to provide them with a lot of the services that years ago they would get at the, at the hospital uh, for 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 days and weeks uh, after the the immediate crisis. Um, is that uh, the phenomenon that you observe for uh, unhoused individuals? Um, I've been a nurse for almost 30 years, and the length of stay of patients in the hospital has dramatically decreased for many reasons. I mean, technology is one reason, right? We are able to treat patients uh, quicker and with better medicine. But um, the amount of unhoused patients that we're discharging, unfortunately, uh, we have to discharge them for many reasons, and we try to find the best possible discharge for them. For them. And, you know, it's a combined effort with us, with the physicians at the hospital, with our community partners, um, and it, it's really tough to do, but we are also bound by CMS guidelines where we can't keep these folks in the hospital um, unless we're treating them. And then we also have to make sure that we're able to serve the rest of the community. So do you have the same kind of thing that uh, that I, I deal with in my uh, work of representing people in psychiatric hospitals where every day it has to be certified that they're in need of uh, inpatient level of care? Um, yes and no. I mean, we do our best where we do have to make sure that they're meeting the correct level of care, care. but we do at times have patients that we cannot discharge because of it um, and just stay right in the hospital. And we do our best to meet their needs at a lo higher level of care in a lower level of care in a higher level of setting. Sorry. Um, and it's not ideal for anybody because they really aren't getting the needs that they need, right? Whether it's a nursing home level of care, rehab level of care, we're in acute care hospital. We do our best to meet their needs. Um, and we really do our best to try and make sure that all the patient patients are in medical care. It just it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, thanks. Um, I don't know if you're the right person to direct this to, but... Uh... Councillor Gill earlier mentioned the idea about uh, mobile uh, care teams of some kind. Is, is that something that you think uh, Central Vermont could uh, could play a role in? Um, you know, I'm not positioned that just directly. Um, you know, of course, it would take financing and approval, and but I personally think it would be a great idea. Um, just we live in such a rural area that access to health care is difficult all around. Um, so not even just for the unhoused. It's, it's really difficult for some of our um, aging population who need regular um, eyes on them, but they just can't get, get that. I, I, I think it's a great idea, but I'm not in a position to say whether the hospital will be able to provide that in the near future or not. Sure, thanks. Other council members have questions before we, because we also have Kristen Sheeman here with us. 
Hi. Yes, I'm listening in. I'm actually driving. I apologize. And I'm in, in the middle of Boston right now, so I'm trying to pay attention to not kill my heels while I'm at it. Um, I'm happy to answer questions shortly when I come to a stop, if I can. Um, one thing I do want to point out, though, um, is, you know, some of the, some of these issues are really affecting not only us at the hospital, um, but our friends in EMS as well. Um, as Sherry mentioned earlier, we had the other night, um, we had some folks coming in just looking for shelter at the hospital. So, and at least one of these people called 911, um, basically just looking for a ride to come spend the night in the waiting room at the emergency. Um, and the unfortunate thing with that is I totally am sympathetic to these folks because obviously it's getting colder and colder outside and we want to be able to help people but at the same time it's taking those emergency services away from folks who are having actual medical emergencies so it really puts us all in a really tough position um, to be able to help our community members um, when we don't have those resources I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking now so I can okay thanks yeah don't 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 <laughs> crash um, the, um, should we assume that the people you're talking about are not uh, eligible to be kept there or, or you're not required to keep those people there under EMTALA because they're not seeking medical care? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else have any? Thanks to both of you for uh, participating. Um, and I hope we can have some more conversations. Um, now, you brought some, yes. I did. Why don't you come on up? Okay. Um, and um, well, um, I'm here to advocate for them because they would like to be able to live in their tent. And a lot of people around here are living in their tents. They like their tents. They're very good at surviving out in the wild. It's not to say that they wouldn't that would turn down something better. Mm -hmm. But I think if we if we occur tonight. There isn't anything better for a lot of people. And whatever we could do immediately, it won't cost anything. And I think we have enough personnel in all kinds of places to uh, to figure these, these the, the workings out. But I, I would like to ask the council to allow people to camp on the Elks Club property for another year. That's my request. Um, I've had this idea about having this variety show at the LNT for people who are in house, who are in house, who go to the soup kitchen, whatever, who want to participate. And the proceeds will go to buying a yurt, which become the first hub for our tent village. And I, I think it's really important because one, we need to affirm that a lot of these people have really amazing talents. And, you know, who knows, 18 months down the road, we'll be out all without power. They'll be crashed everywhere. And they're the ones who are going to show us how to live. So right now they're at a loss uh, being able to live like we do, and they need they need some incremental kind of steps to bring them back into this postmodern world. And I think if we start with the camping, maybe we can move into little houses, tiny houses, or we can move into uh, shelters and other places at the state facility, whatever. Anyway, um, I think there's okay. potential here for a, a, a national prototype, and I would like Brooke to um, talk to us about what she would like if you're still awake. So Brooke, thanks for coming. Can you tell us who you are? Um, I'm Brooke and I currently live in our community in a tent. Um, I <clears throat> originally ended up in this position due to domestic violence, um, the breakup of a domestic relationship. And as a result, I became homeless um, and jobless. And so I've been in the community. Um, one of the struggles that I face is I've got places like Capstone who get funding and things like that, they give me a tent and then I go post my tent, but then I end up having to move my tent because I can't tent there. Um, like for example, Barry City, there's, you can't live in a tent in Barry City or Barry Town. 
So we had officers that would come in the morning, make us move our tents at 6 a.m. when we have nowhere to go. And we're getting all these things donated, but then we don't have a place to go. So I think that having, sorry, <laughs> having something like a tent city or a place that we could go with our tents would be helpful. And listening to everybody talk about budgeting, but budgeting isn't really the issue. It's the fact that they're a good chunk of the community is homeless. None of them are here, but I am. And like, I leave here, I get to go to sleep in a tent in the cold. And hope that I don't get moved tonight by an officer or somebody in the community that doesn't want us there. Um, so I kind of like her idea because we don't, I asked cops in Barry where I could go and they said outside Barry City. That's all they would tell me. I come to Berlin in the Berlin area. They don't seem to have a problem. They, we have had no issues with Berlin police or like Montpelier police, but we run into the issue of not having somewhere to tent. And then you have like some community members and tents who they're not that great with like picking up their area and things like that. That makes people that are in tents look bad where we do clean up after ourselves, but we don't have all those resources. So I think the idea of having somewhere, if there can't be a budget, like everybody's talking about and you're made to fund housing and help people that are homeless, the people that are already out in the tents and in the community, having somewhere for us to be able to be where we're not constantly harassed about it would be helpful because I can't just go get an apartment. So that's why I wanted to come and talk because it's, I'm listening to all this about budgeting, but that's not really, it's not as much of a viable solution as looking at the situation as is and what can be done to help those that are already in the community that are in the tents. Thanks. Any questions for any members of the council? Brooke, thanks for coming. Are you staying in, in Montpelier right now? Um, I'm currently in the Berlin area uh -huh. in between. So we come to Montpelier for resources like the community meals um, to go to another way, which is another agency that like you can go shower, things like that. We mm -hmm. utilize those local resources out here because there's not really anything in Berlin. Yeah. But Berlin's basically the only area where we can tent, where we don't have to move all the time. So. Okay. Thanks. Um, I, I do want to get uh, more public comments, but uh, this this seems like a good segue to uh, to go over some of the uh, short term actions that the city of Montpelier, other municipalities, and the League of Cities and Towns have uh, have brought to the state as. Uh, <clears throat> things that could be done immediately to, uh, to address the crisis. And the first one on the list is the immediate opening of state land buildings and facilities for encampments, shelters, and temporary housing. Chris, I know you're the only <laughs> uh, state official who's here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I've got the recommendations. I've seen the written documents from the council. Uh, mm -hmm. I would make sure others in the state are aware, but I don't control what are the open state plans. Uh huh. Okay. And Can then, we, uh, just yeah, to, to the point that Brooke just made, um, the issue with the camping Theater. and <clears throat> move it out there. I will. So, to the issue that Brooke just made, the issue with the camping mm -hmm. is. You know, managing the site. You know, we have folks who who do clean up their sites and, and behave, and others that don't. And where the city has had the challenges, like at the Elks Club, there were a handful of people camping there for quite a while. We didn't have any problem, and then it grew as the word gets out that it's okay, and suddenly it was beyond our means. And so I think when we suggest if the state had whether it's already existing campgrounds that are already designed for this and could provide resources or their staffing or, you know, it, it's not just the ground. It's, it's how, because once word gets out that it's okay, then you're going to get a lot of people because there's a lot of Brooks out there that need a place to go. And so I think I'd ask, as you talk to your folks, it's not just, can we open up the state land? It's can we open up the state land and provide some supports and make sure there's bathrooms and make sure there's, 
you know, services, checking on people, mental health, you know, the connections, all those kind of things that we might do in a shelter. Uh, and again, I think we all agree that camping isn't the best solution, but between now and December 1st, it sounds like it's the best solution for a lot of people. Thanks. Tori. I, I want to speak to the concern about if we offer something that is desperately needed, people will hear about it and, and they'll and, all come and here. Be, be, be loud, please. Oh, okay. Um, is this loud enough? That's better, yes. Okay, I can pretend I'm shouting upstairs, yes. which is yes. very annoying to my family. <laughs> um, the um, I Because the concern has come up several times, and it came up around the clearing of the encampment at the Elks Club, that if... Um, if it became if it, if people knew that you could camp here, um, they would come from somewhere else. I called um, the very um, you know really pretty complex um, systems of support for unhoused people in the Upper Valley and also down in Brattleboro, um, which are very very evolved and offer a huge range of services. And said, um, have are you aware whether this happens around the state? And what I was told very consistently was that. Typically, like all the rest of us, people who are unhoused most of the time will stay in the community that they are from, in the community where they have associates, they have work, they have connections. And they have not found, although people keep predicting that if they do the good thing they're doing, people will come from somewhere else, that has not been their experience. They also pointed me, pointed me to some, I think, national research, which also supports that that is not people's experience. I want to really urge... Um, an approach as best we can of generosity and fearlessness of spirit as we think about how we are responding to this need. Um, and I think, I, I think that, and, and, and to remember that Brooke is an individual, um, the group of young people living very peaceably um, up at the Elks Club, including the individual who did the hunger strike, are individuals. Um, Unhoused people are individuals just like all of us are individuals and not to cluster, um, you know, not, not, not to have kind of a mass, a mass reaction to something that is made up of a group of individuals who are very marginalized and very much in need. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Terry. Um, I'll, I'll go down some of the other issues that we've got uh, because I know that uh, the state has these uh, things that we've asked for. Not everybody in attendance may have them, but those include the state must take an active role in the siting, creation, and operation of more temporary and permanent shelter space. The state must take ownership of their human service responsibilities. Immediate changes in judicial and prosecutorial approach for those individuals who are compromising public safety with their behavior. And I wanna emphasize that the phrasing of that is compromising public safety with behavior. It's not presence, it's not being there, it's there are some people who are posing a threat to behavior, public safety, and it's, it's the behavior that's doing it. And uh, right size and manage the general assistance program so that motel and hotel owners are not controlling our emergency housing policies and not dictating where homeless families and individuals are housed and provide immediate operating capital to nonprofit organizations and municipalities serving the homeless population. These are all things that could and should be done on, uh, on a short-term and immediate uh, basis. Steve. Thanks. Uh, I think it's folly to keep even this tonight politicizing homelessness as if it's the governor versus the rest of us or the governor versus the towns. That's just nonsense. The, the capacity does not exist in Chris's agency either to find uh, convenient infrastructure and manage these facilities. And, and nobody, 
these folks don't want to live under a National Guard uh, emergency camp either. So I think that short-term solutions that are low cost, innovative, that can last for the next several years, uh, consider interim solutions while we build new uh, tiny home communities or uh, new affordable housing or new group homes, whatever is it going to be. But congregate shelters and porta potties are lacking fundamental dignity. They're lacking health healthiness. Uh, people living on the street need to wash themselves, all angles. You know, a porta potty doesn't offer that option. You know, congregate shelters. People pass cold, flu, COVID around. It's not. It's not okay. Privacy is, the lack of privacy is the most aggravating factor to the decreasing mental stability of folks living outside. So privacy, this, the solution, I believe, the near-term reachable solution is what I call soft housing. Be they cheaper and less, uh, less than the pallets. The pallets are above 10 grand a piece now. But Conestoga huts, are maybe three three grand by now. They were a thousand. Now they're presumably up to three. They can be insulated. They can be secure sleeping. They can have a locking door so your possessions are secure. That safety of possessions, safety of sleeping, and access to a shower, a hot shower, and a toilet that creates the foundation of of stability and equal equilibrium that people need to consider what the next step on their ladder is. And it'll be different for different people. Some people can demonstrate their sobriety and go to work staying up all night to make sure nobody gets assaulted at the showers and toilets. You know, they can be paid for that. 25 bucks an hour, you know. Others can be building the platforms for the Conestoga huts that are going to Rutland or Brattleboro, you know, earning job skills. This is, this is not rocket science, but these huts would be in clusters around different locations on the country club property, wired the way the festival grounds at, in the Burlington waterfront, these portable distribution boxes, you know, a six gauge, eight gauge cable that connects the boxes and then several electric outlets off of them so that there's a phone charging and a reading light and a heating mat a little radiant heating mat in each of these clusters. This is a low cost, rapidly possible solution that the management issue, part of the reason you don't want, you can't staff good Sam is because it's an intrusive, coercive, punitive environment. People get invaded at all hours of the, the day or night. It's not, I think if we create a, a model that grants dignity and privacy to folks, more people will want to work there, that, that it will attract. It's a new model, a sustainable model. Hopefully, it will be, need to be too sustainable. But And then again, invite other areas of the state. Uh, the churches in Oregon, each church was allowed six of these Conestoga huts to be connected and use the, the bathroom facilities at the church. No zoning, no, no obstacles there. But we've got Peace Park, we've got Gateway Park, we've got the cemetery, we've got Hubbard Park, we've got Elks Club is the one where we could do the most, the quickest. Um, and it fits with our two to four year due diligence that's still going to be required before we have our designs and our approved capital plan and our negotiated second road and all that. We've got this unused, it's hypocritical for us to tell the state to open their land when we're just reacting to fear, they might come. You know, that's no way to make government policy or demonstrate the professed compassion and you know equity issues that we talk about. You know, we need to not respond to fear. We need to respond to need and come up with these are solutions that can provide a ladder from a soft shelter to a single room occupancy. Walgreens is going to be open and empty in another month. There, I've provided to many of you solutions, furniture that works in a store, in an empty store that is create privacy screens and it's basically sophisticated cubicles that have a little cage for your pet, 
a privacy screen, a white noise generator, so that many people could be in a room without he hearing each other's farts, you know? And so we could probably put 40 people into Walgreens, you know, if, if we buy invest in the furniture, and that's reusable. The trailers, I've spoken to Chris Winters about ordering the trailers. We should have ordered them last summer because they take a while to build trailers that have the plumbing and the flush plumbing and the hot showers. If they're not located where water and sewer currently is, it will require pump trucks. Um, but each site needs to be evaluated and assessed. Is there cell phone coverage? Is there emergency vehicle access? There's a whole bunch of public safety dimensions that need to be verified. But Elks Club has water and sewer right at the corner of the building. We could put four trailers together that have four showers in each, so eight showers and, and eight flush toilets, you know? And, and then people have to walk a few hundred yards to get there. That's not a, that's not a problem. You know, the people who are handicapped might need to be inside the building. Otherwise, the inside of the building should be reserved for meetings with mental health counselors, job coaches, you know, resume assistants, et cetera, you know. But this is not, I've been working on this design for years, and I just can't believe that we keep just like going through the same thing. Five years of the homelessness task force and still haven't got a plan. It's, it's folly to ask the state for money when you don't have a plan. Here's a plan, you know? Um, I think that's that's enough. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Phil. I'm, first of all, I think those are all great ideas. You know, I just want to with what Steve said and what Tori said um, about the city and, and particularly the comment about asking the state for money. And I think the fundamental issue here from my perspective, I don't want to speak for the council, but certainly I know that this was the issue in speaking with other municipalities, is it the way the government's set up in Vermont, at least, that the Agency of Human Services, the state, is the primary provider for these services. We don't ask the state to fight fires from Montpelier. We don't ask the state to respond to police calls in Montpelier. We don't ask the state to run our rec program. So there are programs that municipal governments run and so, you know, if the state were to take management and propose something like this at our site with covering up, I'm not sure we'd be against that. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is we as a city don't necessarily have the wherewithal. So I, I think those are good, creative ideas. I hope Chris heard them. We'd be happy to talk about them or other states. It's just not, it's, it's, this is we, what we're seeing is that there has been a resp fundamental responsibility part of the state to deal with the needy community. In our view, it hasn't been met and it has all fallen. So we have seen the impacts. We've seen it on our police. You know, we've got the data about the number of calls. We've got the data. About the, we've seen the impacts in the community where people are hanging out and, and not everyone is practicing good behavior. I know, Tori, a lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. And, and we're seeing it. We've heard we've had reports about the, the situations that people run into. And we're, we're trying to help work with the, the reason for this meeting is to figure out how we can find solutions. So I do really appreciate Steve, the comments. Those are really good suggestions. And I want to be clear, just speaking again for myself, I'm not trying to blame anybody else. We're trying to make sure that we are getting the right people doing the right job in the right place. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Um, I saw a hand in the back. I'll let Zach go first. Oh, okay. Well, I, I appreciate everyone out here tonight, and I I want to share a couple of different things. Um, first of all, I want to share a success story that uh, my one of my closest friends uh, was is homeless as of tonight in a hotel. However, she will be in an apartment within the next week. Uh, this is a success story. Uh, she did this uh, her own uh, volition and felt it was important to do it. She managed to do it. Uh, now, not everybody can do that, but for every success story, somebody's going to be getting evicted or asked to leave housing. Uh, that's the other side that is not uh, that I really uh, bring here. Uh, and we're seeing a lot more of it, and there seems to be a lot less flexibility. Uh, <laughs> people as young as in their 20s are learning very hard lessons right now about what it means to be in an apartment, 
uh, had a young woman this afternoon tell me, well, she uh, she's going to be out of an apartment as well uh, because of hard lessons. This is not going to go away. Um, we will have camping here, regardless of whether we have policy or not. This isn't going to go away. And I think the tension that was felt is because we're trying to get that message out. This isn't about, um, you know, I, I think it's really about what we, what we need right now. Um, and I'm just really concerned. And I want to say that I uh, took it upon myself to try to get more folks here. Uh, and I do appreciate Brooke coming out. Uh, but these folks have a lot of concerns right now. And it's not coming in front of, you know, policymakers right now, if they don't feel listened to, um, unfortunately. Um, really need to feel like they're being listened to. And that's the hard part. And, you know, I encourage, I'm, I'm encouraged uh, by this meeting, and I hope we can have more of these on a regular, you know, basis, maybe not something like this, but we really do need to be able to come in front of y'all uh, once in a while, the task force and communicate. And I appreciate your time tonight and my bedtime soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Uh, Dawn West, you've had your hand up for a little while, so I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. It's John Little. I'm having um, device issues here. Um, uh -huh. I did say that the problem at the Elks Club was not really due to the number of people, but to the behaviors and to some extent to the location. Anytime that you have a space where people directly interface with other public uses, you are going to have friction. Um, also, if we had a number of camping spaces spread out, then you would have far fewer people who lost the resources due to the behavior of other people that they are not able to control. So I'd really like to see that. And as Zach said, whether or not we have supervision, whether or not we have sanitation, people are still going to be camping. And the more, um, I mean, Steve, by the way, a lot of what he said really makes sense. And it's not a one size fits all solution. There are people who are able to succeed in congregate situations and people who are not. And the camping is in some ways the same. You have more than one lifestyle. You have more than one level of tolerance for behavior. And if we had different places for people to camp, I think there would be less conflict and perhaps less need for supervision. Um, if also, if we had a way to respond to behaviors that were not acceptable, that would help us. That would help us to keep order. Um, but even the people who are behaving in what we consider to be an unmanageable way also need a place to live so that they don't freeze to death. Um, but clearly, we, we run into the same thing with the day space. It, it, the proximity to other people doesn't work. And people need a place to go that does not put them in direct contact with, with other people who are forced to walk by them and through them. So that's another consideration and another concern that the task force had was having a space for people to go in the daytime. They can't afford to go in stores. They can't, they shouldn't be expected to spend every moment of their time in conditions where they are supervised and listened to by agency employees. They need to have some place where they can sit down out of the rain and the snow and relax. Um, and that shouldn't be the bike path or the library or the agency because that doesn't work. Um, people do need privacy and they need space and they need they need safety. Thanks. Thanks, Don. <clears throat> I'm Connor Kennedy, a uh, Montpelier resident, but I'm going to wear, try to balance two hats. I'm also the chief staff to the Speaker of the House. Um, nice loud voice. I, I'll try I to be loud. It. I can be loud. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to be tempered because uh, I have a lot of thoughts, but I'm also going to couch my thoughts on the administration's response to this with the governor, who's the one that signed the budgets. I used to work with the Agency of Human Services, and we used to joke that the commissioner of BCF 
has the worst job in state government. <laughs> so I do not envy Chris and his crew at DCF whatsoever. Um, I, I think uh, I'll just start with the recent around the Elks Club. Uh, Mr. Whitaker and I don't often agree, but I guess I struggle to understand our rationale for asking the state for state lands when we have a property that hopefully one day will be developed, it's a separate conversation, that is right there. We have great partners with Good Sam in another way. For the last three years, I've lived sharing a driveway with another way. Amazing neighbors there. Never have had an issue. Um, it's a program that this legislative session I used in uh, conversations talking about not having one provider, but having multiple providers work together because of how successful I think Good Sam and uh, Another Way have worked. Um, and so I, I'm not going to pretend to understand the difficulties that EMS, police, and fire have had to deal with. You know, when we're at the house, we know when there's a good day or a bad day at another way because of how many times they have to respond. It's just the reality of it. Um, but there's got to be a way we can find a, a path forward. <clears throat> when I take my dog to walk there every day, we have kids playing soccer there every day, but we can't have people live there. Like, it just doesn't feel right. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that Elks Club piece there. Um, Zach said something at the beginning about the work of the homelessness task force at the statewide level, not the Montpelier one. He said, we had a lot of Zoom meetings, but what has happened in the last four years? What has the governor done? I don't know. Like, you know, we've asked for reports the last four years for them to come back with a comprehensive plan. This transition obviously is heartbreaking and difficult. I think it's really important for people to know, like their plan was 35 days. We have 80, this was 35. We spent over $70 million to help with this transition. This was less than that. So like, if we think it's bad now, I, I and I'm not trying to say, hey, look how much better we did, but like, it could have been so much worse. And so when we talk about the state coming to help, they're not coming. Like we have to get over that idea. They're not coming. And it's not the DCF crew. This is a governor's choice. It's his administration. If they wanted to come, they would have come. They're not coming. So I don't know what that means as far as us as a community and other communities figuring this out. Um, when we're back in session in January, obviously we're gonna have this conversation again, but in this moment, I think we all need to be honest with ourselves. Like. The governor is not going to show up, hasn't for the last four years, isn't going to all of a sudden show up now. It, it's just the reality. Um, so again, I, I just wanted to shout out our crew here because we're looking at it across the state and we are super fortunate to have our community folks, EMS, uh, Montpelier Police and Fire, they do an amazing job. Um, Julie said it earlier, Human bodies, even if we could, they don't exist. It's our problem, right? Like we talk to general uh, contractors, they can't get enough contractors to build affordable housing because their contractors don't have affordable housing. It's the chicken and the egg. We go around in a circle, but even if we had all the money in the world, it's really difficult to try to help get Good Sam and other community providers and people that they need. Um, Julie mentioned it's not a quick solution now for the buildings. Totally agree. I always think like maybe all of us could grab our toolkits and just go into a building and fit it up. Obviously not how it works. I think we all wish we could. Um, I guess I would add that as we are thinking about the strain in our community and other communities are doing this, I hope that we, and you in, in your capacity as a city council, take this back and work with other city councils, other mayors across the state and understand that for this administration's time there, the governor, they've done an arbitrary 3% cap on their budget. 
It's just a 3%. It sounds awesome. I wish I could keep my budget within 3%. Inflation, healthcare, everything goes up. I can't. They've chosen to do this 3%. The brilliant part of this is the cost and the need don't go away. They go downstream. So now we as a community have to figure out how to deal with that. EMS, MPD, they have to figure it out. If we moved it to state land, guess what? VSP has 20% vacancy rate. It's not like they're fully staffed and they're like, we can take on the state land work. We can respond to those crises. All of these agencies, departments, municipalities are struggling with no resources. So at the end of the day, the governor can say, I held the budget to 3%. That's awesome. That's great fiscal management from a pure fiscal number. But what is the reality? The services and the needs haven't gone away. They've increased and now we're left with it. And so I don't, I respect the administration's uh, position that they're in, in trying to take care of the state. I also believe at the same time that they could choose to put forward a budget that actually reflects the needs of our state, especially our most vulnerable. I'm just going to say it again, that's not going to happen. So as a community, we have to think creatively about how we're going to deal with it. It's kind of terrifying. I think Montpelier is, in Washington County as a whole, is better suited to figure it out than many other communities. But like, I just think we have to couch that and know that that is our reality in this moment. Come January, legislature's back. We're gonna to try to do all we can. It took a significant amount for us to get to the 80 day, 70 plus million dollars, which is still not enough. But I just, I think we all need to be eyes wide open about this reality. He's not gonna call a state of emergency, We're not gonna get magical funds. Shout out to Chris and his team for opening up these, working to open up these family shelters. But like, there's not gonna be a big fix from this administration. And so it's gonna take all of us, especially the community providers, um, to work together to be creative and figure out a solution. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. Uh, open for you, Bill Connor. Yes, sorry. Right. Question that it, this might be better approach to Chris or Anne or Connor, one of our legislators. I guess I'm just thinking about we had, like, so tonight we've heard from multiple people that the um, it ended up being like worst case scenario, like people were hoping that the way that this was gonna roll out, like more couches would become available or whatever, and like it didn't. Um, and I'm also thinking about post flood, the joint fiscal committee was able to find money um, off session to put into helping flood victims. Is there an opportunity? And I was just looking, it looks like November 6th is the next joint fiscal co committee could people come together, take the time between now and January and November 6th to develop an emergency fund to get people back in motels for that November 6th to December 1st, and at least give us a little time, like a few more weeks of people not in the freezing cold with these huge medical issues, their newborn baby, whatever the situation is, um, you know, just figure out what that short-term thing as we like continue to buy time to try to get the long-term solutions. Is that possible? Is anyone talking about that? I'll, I'll take it to our uh, but I will say from our side, it's something that we continue to look at. Um, the reality is, is that very smart fiscal people during the last three years essentially were able to move the federal funds that we got from the Biden administration around to free up the funds like we used last year for the flood. Those funds are gone. And so as a state, we're like fiscally healthy, but we don't have the same flexibility to sort of like, oh, we can push this over here and cover this with ARPA dollars. And so we're more back to a reality. We're still fiscally healthy, but we don't have the same flexibility, I would say, to be as nimble. Um, but I know that there's other people that are looking at uh, that date, not just with this issue, but as we know, Montpelier sort of lucked out with this flood. Other communities were not as lucky so that's part of um, that discussion as well to help out or see if we can help out that situation, but it's ongoing. And I guess, I mean, maybe, maybe Chris, like it sounds like one thing we're hearing is given the challenges 
sometimes with space and sometimes with finding staffing or whatever, like that there some t- that money, like there's maybe some money available, like maybe that was allocated to AHS somewhere that like maybe we reprioritize in the short term, like let's redirect some funds because, you know, whether, I don't know if the full 10 million has been expended. I don't know if like there's other funding that, um, you know, it just feels like, I don't even know what three weeks of additional motels for at least this most vulnerable population in this latest round um, would even cost. But just hearing that as one like urgent need and like just something we could do in the short term as we continue the long-term solution, as we look at raising revenue from the wealthiest Vermonters, which I think we should do and like a whole host of other things. But I don't know, is there any, like, do you think there would be? Yeah, that's, that's up to some very creative budget folks to figure out what I think <clears throat> the 10 million is um, in, in flight and kind of earmarked, but there's always the potential that one or more of those projects run into a, a barrier that we can't overcome right away. So some of that money could be pushed to, you know, you know gas flow and budget adjustment. So that can free up some money now. If we have other viable solutions, I think that there's a conversation to be had, whether it's back in the hotel or motel program. Yeah. I mean, and I think that everyone agrees that's not the long term solution. And having people plugging into City Hall with their ventilator, just like that's not okay. So, like, it's, I think it needs to be a both and. Like, how are we helping people today? And how are we figuring out how to raise the revenue for the long term solutions we know we need? Yeah, you know, really question. I want to follow up on your comment. I appreciate your comments just about reaching out with other communities. So I, another hat, I, we were talking about wearing hats, one of the other I hat is I'm currently the president of Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And when I reached out about mm-hmm. this issue, I've never had so many people respond, like the other communities were like, where do I sign? This is killing us. This is not just Montpelier. The league board, uh, so we, we, in about a week, pulled together a handful of about 20 communities that signed that letter, had the press conference. The next week or last week, the, the league board adopted this as you know kind of official policy. What you described, the pass on to the local governments, you know, I, BSP does have a ton of, uh, you know, what you, what was that, 20% vacancies, so does MPD. Yeah. You know, I mean, and so does most of the other police departments in the state. So, so everyone's feeling that. And I think, um, and every, you know, it's not that nobody, that people want to be heartless. It's that we can't even, you know, Ask anyone to live in Montpelier. We can barely pave our roads, right? So, how, how can we, you know, we need the folks, and 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 I think we share the same fears that they're not going to show up. But we also felt like, you know, we feel like we need to say this out loud and raise awareness as we go into budget, as we do these things, because certainly sitting here and quiet and just saying, "Well, no one's coming," isn't going to help either. So, um, definitely appreciate those. Ever, just as an addendum, I don't think I get an addendum, but because you brought it up. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was sent an article of WCX posted, and it was the governor asking the city of Burlington not to close the park that they have there because it's, you know, the season's ending and they're closing, but there's no option given to them for how they would support that work. So fully appreciate that. It's sort of like, don't do this, but we don't have another option for you, recognizing that even Burlington, our largest city, they don't have the resources to handle it as well. So, thank you. Also, this just turned off, so I don't know how important <laughs> Maybe that's a sign. <laughs> Thanks, Connor. Thank you. Um, I think it's worth pointing out. I, I want to make sure that everyone else, everyone who wants to be heard from is heard from. It's worth pointing out that uh, the city council has has a legislative committee and just within the last couple of days we've been exchanging emails to uh, to start our planning for uh, for the coming legislative session uh, we were very successful in getting state funds uh, in this past legislative session and in part because we had a a paid lobbyist uh, working out working on it for us. We don't have that money in our budget this year, so we're definitely going to be looking at trying to find a way to continue funding our lobbyists. But I I would be very surprised if 
pushing uh, the state for more uh, support for services for unhoused people is very high on our uh, priority list this year. That point, uh, you know, obviously one of the reasons we our lobbyists was certainly helpful, and one of the reasons we got state funding was because we had a major flood, and and we had an event that precipitated that. And I just say this, you've heard me say this before, but we got, you know, in the last four years, the state's homeless population has gone from, you know, a thousand people to thirty five hundred people, roughly, at the point in count. And if there were a natural 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 disaster or some other event that left 3,500 people without homes, this would be a state of emergency. And there would be, people, we would be all over this as a state. So I just, you know, I think that's the angle. And I, you know, I know you know this, Chris, I'm not picking on you, but uh, there, and I appreciate everything Connor said, but people need to understand this is, this is a real thing. If there was a, you know, wildfires that burned 3,500 homes, we'd be rebuilding them and finding a way and the state would be more creative while we're here we'll talk about we'll catch you later about how to fund housing because we have some thoughts about that too but Meredith. yeah i just meredith warner again i just want to add to your comment uh and this is just something i read in, in um bt digger and i think it was a digger that um uh, it was reported that 429 homes were lost in the 24 flood and I don't know how many homes, that's units. I don't know how many units were lost in the 23 flood. And it feels like there might be, a, it might be a useful data point to have in your back pocket. <coughs> the state can help us understand how many units were lost in Washington County. Because to your point of the rise in numbers, part of that is loss of actual housing, like physical housing that is no longer here. So I think that's really important to talk about that piece as well, because I think that contributes to an argument around like, this is the loss we've experienced from these natural disasters. And because of it, we are experiencing this increase in homelessness that is beyond what other counties might be seeing. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks, sir. All right. I've just been coming up with a running list of like tangible things that I think we can do that I'm hearing. Um, one officially calling on the states to reinstate the motel program until and as we build a longer term solution. I think we should, and I don't, I mean, maybe we send a message to the joint fiscal committee. Like we as a community experiencing this are here, happy to help talk about the implications and call for that and if we can work with your team Chris on like how do we collectively get creative about moving some funds for you know whatever that would be for to get you know at least at least a few more weeks of these winter months to get people into the motels um, I think we could explore as a council declaring a public a public health emergency and call on the state in our declaration to do the same I mean I know it's like a similar thing as we've done at the press conference, but like, let's keep trying to build attention. Let's keep talking about that this is an emergency. Maybe there are funds or things that we could <laughs> access. I, I, I doubt it, but we could tell the state that they could access funds and resources if they do it. Um, and maybe we get to other communities to do the same and we can collectively build some momentum by you know accessing this network of um, you know, use VLCT and stuff to encourage other communities. I think, you know, the city should certainly prioritize as we go into budget season funding, you know, continuing our support for Good Sam or peer outreach work or social worker, um, look, continuing the process on like the potential transitional housing. I think we can, should continue looking at our policies around camping. We need to make sure that people have places to go, that they can sleep, that they can stay and be unharassed, if, you know, and and then longer term, I think this going on our legislative agenda, I think calling for, you know, raising the adequate revenue, looking at things like the wealth tax to help fund the transition until we have more housing and continuing to pri prioritize investing in housing and the longer term solutions um, as we have these short term kind of stop gaps. So that's the list I've captured. Is, so, that's all. Okay. <laughs> how Yes. The um, 
the just as a point of historical record, the homelessness task force um, proposed um, to city council that you declare a state of emergency. Um, I, I want to say a year and a half ago, but it might have been two. It might have been two years ago, and we were actually told, but I, I don't know how authoritatively that that wasn't a thing that that couldn't be done. So I think that we kind of rephrased it as something that wasn't quite a state of emergency. But if you look in the minutes, I bet it's still there. You know, you could just like yeah. edit it, call it an emergency. Thank you. <laughs> something. <laughs> well, we have another meeting next week. So Chris mentioned looking into another opportunity in Montpelier for another facility for housing. And I think whatever we can do to support the state doing that, uh, I, I think that should be on our immediate list too. Yeah. Yes. I just want to, before everybody, um, I'm often anxious coming into these meetings, as you might imagine. <laughs> Um, but this has been really, I, I just, I just want to say thank you. It's been a really good and healthy conversation. I appreciate the focus on solutions. I really appreciate the kind of the understanding of the nuance and the, that it's, it's not easy. Um, and it's not all in, in DCF's lap either. This will really help inform me in, in my decision-making, in my communication with other parts of state government. Um, I have a, a weekly meeting every Thursday morning uh, with the governor. We focus on housing. Uh, I'm there. The commissioner of, of uh, housing and community development is there along with many members of the cabinet. And we do talk about housing. This will, the, the issue of shelters will come up. I'll be able to relay some of what I heard here today. And it, I think it helps the governor in, in his awareness and decision-making and the people around him as well. So this is really productive for me. Uh, appreciate the open conversation and the invitation. I can't always go to these meetings, but I'm really glad that I came tonight. Yeah, I, tell, tell them we really beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to take one for the team here, but but really, I, I, it's not about me. It's not about DCF. I, try, I don't take those things personally, but it's looking systemically and what are the ways that we can work together as partners? What are the ways that I know that I can show up, that DCF can show up? And how can I bring other parts of state government to the table? Um, and, and glad that we have a community that's really open to, uh, to trying to solve this very much unsolvable problem, but we have to keep trying. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here, Chris. I know it's, it's a big job that you've got. And because uh, the very nature of your job is dealing with some of the most intractable problems that people in our society have. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Um, I think we'll see these things coming up on our agendas in very short order. Um, I'm not going to promise that everything's going to be on the agenda for September, for October 23rd, but we'll start getting on this stuff. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Our meeting isn't quite over yet, but it's uh, almost done. Uh, I think we can close bring, uh, this workshop to a close. Um, do we have uh, any city council reports? Just shake your head no if you don't have anything to say. No. Adrian, no. Sal? Uh, no, I, I, I um, spent a little time this afternoon looking at what New York City spends on homelessness. It's a population of about 8 million people. They, they have an operating budget of $2 billion and 2,000 employees in their Department of Homeless Services. So it's not a small problem. Um, they're a thousand times bigger than we are, but... Um, and, and they've had it for quite a while. But I mean, it's, it's just overwhelmingly huge. Uh, and, and it seems obvious that the tiny town of Montpelier really can't do it alone. So we're gonna have to work with uh, a bunch of partners, including the state, I hope, but. Um, I, I, 
Sal, I, it's wonderful to have that um, data, and I would draw the exact opposite conclusion <laughs> from 40 years, however long it's been that I've been living and working in Vermont, that um, because we're a city of 8,000 people, because we're a state of around 600,000 people, we actually can solve some of these problems. Um, e Eugene, Oregon is one example has, but I think there are other places have, have really um, been very successful in getting people who could be gotten into housing into housing that was affordable and workable. But I think we can do that. That's a lot of why we came back to Vermont is that we can do that on the scale of this state and we can do that on the scale of this city when it, perhaps in New York it isn't doable. So I'm, I'm sorry you. to turn that into no, a sermon. No, no, I hope you're right, Tori. That's a very good observation. <laughs> uh, moving down the line, Tim, do you have anything? Uh, Lauren? Um, Palin, do you have anything? to close out with and uh, Carrie. Okay, thank you. Um, may I will forego a mayor's report too. Is the city clerk there and does the city clerk have anything to report? No report. Okay. City manager's report? Okay, thank you all for being here. It is, it is 945 and we are adjourned.